Okay, guys, we are live! So for those listening at home, welcome to the Dungeon Musings YouTube channel. My name is Kevin Madison, and I'll be your friendly referee today, because today we are carrying on with our ongoing campaign, playing, or campaign adventure, I don't know what we're calling it, our own, uh, I guess, trip, uh, playing Mongoose Publishing's Outstanding Traveler, second edition sci uh, science fiction RPG. And uh, we are playing through uh, one of, or a modified version, I should say, of their uh, Reach Adventure 5, the Borderland Run, uh, which I mention only because if you intend on playing the Borderland Run, then this session may conclude spoilers for that. Uh, so if you want to save the fun of that adventure for uh, yourself and not have any spoilers, proceed with caution. Um, assuming that you uh, are proceeding forward, allow me to introduce you to the crew uh, of travelers uh, that will be starring in our uh, campaign, or have been, I guess. I'll go uh, the order I've got you guys on the screen here. Why don't you tell us who you are, who you're playing, and um, I guess that's it. There's no levels in this game. So first up is Jeffrey. Hey everybody, I'm Jeff, and I'm playing Alonzo Santoro. Uh, he is a journalist and a would-be author. Very nice. Uh, next up is David. Hi everyone, I'm David, and I'll be playing Dr. Ilias Abdel, a physician and genetic researcher who has recently swapped the safety of the laboratory for the real world to get some hands-on experience. <laughs> nice. Uh, next up is Graham. Hi, I'm Graham. I'm playing Dane Lovrick, who is a former Black Ops Imperial Marine reformed. <laughs> He's feeling much better now. And yeah. alas, but certainly not least, is our stalwart captain, James. Hi, so I'm playing uh, Captain Ganny, who's uh, ex-Imperial Navy, ex-drifter uh, and... Uh, Minor, ex-imperial scout, and ex-merchant. So he's been ex-everything. <laughs> yes. Three ex-wives, too. Curious. <laughs> uh, so then, guys, um, last session was our first actual proper uh, session of the game. Um, what do you guys recall from that? Apart from <laughs> doing a lot of commerce. <laughs> right, let's see if I could assist with some visual cues here. Yeah, I, I remember. I seem to remember boats. Yeah, there we are. Um, yes, we were nice. sort of a team yeah. building exercise of yeah. sorts. Yeah. It was very pleasant. Nothing really bad happened. We we no. on a ship, we had dinner, we, we, we found a job, and then we did some commerce. Nice views. It was good. Yeah, we we're on the planet of Spurla, which is uh, a water world where they. Uh, refine this uh, plankton come whale substance mm -hmm. uh, but we've been offered a job on an ice world for a bit of variety mm -hmm. is it Ar argona uh, argona correct yeah there's a contact you've got there uh, by the name of where is it here danger mcguffin what no that's not it uh, it is uh joaquin strusen a businessman with uh, interest in shipping and heavy industry, um, who also happens to be a part of the Borderland Alliance, a uh, loose uh, organization dedicated to promoting stability and prosperity in the region. Uh, do you, what do you guys recall about the particulars? I mean, you not you don't know a, a lot of the particulars, but there is a one um, uh, definite uh, particular you guys know about it, which is the length of it and the um the ability to earn on the side what do you guys remember about that i think it's a four month job with, with with a flat fee but yeah the opportunity to engage in, in commerce and trading along the route so very appealing to us seeing as we get paid either way and can earn a little bit of extra mm -hmm. or hopefully a lot of extra yeah I, I i think i think the amount we're going to be paid which is you know a, a small detail but I, I think that's probably going to be sorted when we get there um, yeah and it must yeah. be something special because he wants to meet in person to discuss the details yeah mm -hmm. so what our heroes did then is uh after um or over a a lovely meal uh and uh, drinks on the ship uh, our crew uh, elected to uh, pick up some cargo, um, primarily mail, uh, if, if I recall, ca calling in on uh, Captain Ganny's uh, previous uh, work as a scout. Uh, and uh, was it just your rank in the Navy, or was it Anchor's rank in the Navy? Or combo of the two? It was a combo. 
combo of two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and also took on some passengers. So what I'd like to start with today, guys, is let me grab our heroes here or travelers and bring us over to the ship. Today's session is going to be in part um, a bit about getting to know our ship. Mm. So let me place your, you know what, let me make this big so we can be easy to read and see, and then we'll place our travelers around. I don't recall. Do we have a name for the ship as of yet? Uh, the, the Drift, Drift Wanderer. Wanderer. The Drift Wanderer, right. Okay. Rift. Rift Wanderer, okay. There we go. Let me move these guys over to Scooch here. All right. Um... And this is jointly owned by uh, primarily uh, Dr. Abdel and uh, Captain Ghani with shares, I think, by all others. Is that right? Did you all have at least a ship share in your uh, payout? Uh, I didn't have ship shares. Uh, mm -hmm. I did contribute to the start, sort of start fund. Oh, okay, got it. So you're not, and then Alonzo, I think Anchor had ship shares. I can't remember, Alonzo, did you have any ship shares in your two? Okay, so you did as well. All right, so then uh, Dane is the only fully hired gun here, um, literally and metaphorically. Uh, and um, let's talk about the, um, so the, the, the uh, uh, downport in uh, Spurl is, uh, uh, is on the actual uh, ocean world itself. Uh, it is a very, uh, it's not one of the highest tech things, but f in particular for the borderland um, uh, subsector, this is a real standout. Uh, it's a B uh, quality one. So it's got almost all the, you know, most recent and current accoutrements to it. And um, what, um, I guess it's not no the no that is that that is quite uh, advanced isn't it because it's uh, uh, it only goes up to A is that right yeah yeah so yeah so this is a very high tech thing and because the far trader is uh, slipstreamed um, or stream is designed for streamlining you're able to land on the planet. Um, you guys have managed to fill the or fill not only the cargo bay but you have filled the. Um, low berths with uh, individuals. Uh, so we will be seeing, uh, Dr. Ilias, what do you think your per, uh, routine has been for getting people, we're, as a refresher, we're three months into the launch of this whole operation. So I think some of your procedures are still quite, um, you know, maybe works in progress. You're not quite, uh, um, you know, it's not quite so routine that uh, uh, you do it without thinking. I think he'll have done medical checkups of all of the current crew and, and uh, will probably insist on doing some medical checkups on any passengers. Just sort of basic and making sure they didn't bring any pathogens or anything okay. dangerous, dangerous on board. Um, he, are there specific roles on the ship of this type? Well, that's what we're going to talk about as well. One of the things we need to do is for, uh, for those traveling in... Um, low passage there is actually a medical check you need to make when they are uh, unfrozen as it were uh and i was thinking uh there is i know uh penalties that can be inflicted if you've got any kind of underlying health issues i thought that might be something you uh because uh, so the low passage involves being cryogenically frozen and stuffed in a tube with the intention of being thawed out when you reach the destination. It is by no means unknown for travelers to die during low passage, whether from system shock at being frozen or, or being improperly revised or simply a malfunction of the low berth. Uh, it is, let's see here. Just imagine the insurance package you'd have to have just on that. You could, you could, you <laughs> yeah. could, make, you could make a bomb on that. <laughs> Uh, we, we need to make another claim on our uh, live cargo um, <laughs> part of our policy. Um, I know we've already exhausted the deductible on uh, on that this year, but um, let's see here. Um, medicine, I think it's medic. I'm trying to remember. I, cause I remember seeing the actual role with the modifiers. So I thought that that might inform kind of your um, 
what what uh, information you might give to the passengers as they're hmm. you know getting frozen. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll have drawn up a sort of questionnaire about sort of you know, previous health, any underlying health conditions, any family history of X, Y, Z, just for filter out the most common things that can go wrong for like system shock. Yeah. Okay. And you know, standard disclaimers will apply. Yeah, and, um, and there'll yeah. probably be a list saying like, <laughs> you we had all of this explained like just before you go on the surgery when they go like these are all the things that could go wrong if we proceed. These are all the things that could go wrong if we don't proceed. Do you wish yeah. to to go ahead and then sort of make them yeah. Make them yeah. sign for the insurance. And is, um, has Dr. Ilias, I imagine as a, a physician, he's had some time where he's had actual patients as well too, but it mm -hmm. did sound like he was more in the research end. So what's his uh, yes. bedside manner like? <laughs> he's, he'd be a bit standoffish, probably because the a lot of the, the later years in research would have been in very fancy sort of military industrial complexes where you know his, his word would have been obeyed immediately and the patients were not people off the street that have come in but uh, people from like special missions and things who were told to comply so he's possibly still getting used to dealing with uh, you know everyday people and and, and their uh, attitudes and, and and their sort of fears of maybe you know, maybe it's someone's first journey off world or something like that which he's not which he wouldn't be used to so he's probably just like is this for your good just comply yeah but hopefully we'll learn how to be more you know emotionally available for them uh he also may give more information in a, in a very high level way than what they're like they're like what do you yeah. think what yeah um the 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 uh cognitive uh, the reason i was interested in is because the one of the things uh i've come across in i used to do uh more in person like pre-covid uh in-person volunteer work with uh homeless folks and one of the things that was, was always amusing is when we would have corporate lawyers volunteering with that for the first time. Um, not because their, their presence wasn't welcome whatsoever. It's just that <laughs> it was so outside of their, their comfortable rubric. Like They'd be giving these very detailed explanations of contractual interpretations and things like that when these people are swearing affidavits of identification. And the whole people are like, <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Like, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, 158, I found that. Thank you. Um, so basically, it's going to be a routine check. Uh, which takes 1d6 times 10 minutes for each. So the process of freezing, un unfreezing uh, these folks is probably going to be, um, you know, it could be upwards of uh, a good chunk of a day, depending on, uh, you know, on your luck and how fast the process goes. So uh, as part of the onboarding for, you know, uh, I guess for let's let's assume uh, Anchor is taking care of the onboarding for cargo uh, today because Carl wasn't able to make us uh, today. Um, what do you guys uh, think as far as the other parts of the onboard? We're going to talk about the, uh, the, uh, passengers who are, uh, going to be taking up the, uh, the, whatever the other berths are, uh, the basic passage, uh, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but it sounds like Dr. Ilias, you'll be taking care of getting these people, you know, sort of like checked out and getting them set up in the, in the, uh, low berths, getting, making sure that that's running properly. Yep. That sound right? Yeah. Okay. Um, then, oh, the... Um, oh, you know what? Anchor is your pilot, isn't he? Yeah, although I can be a pilot if necessary. Okay. So the crew that's listed on here is Medic, which I think we've already got someone spoken for, Steward, Engineer, Astrogator, and Pilot. Um, where do we think everyone... Alonzo, I'm assuming your uh, strengths are going to be in steward. Yeah, I believe Alonzo is the steward. Because okay. I, I took that when we were passing out the uh, skills, oh, yeah. the uh, the traveler package skills. Mm -hmm. Then I believe that's where I got steward from. Okay. Um, so then we have our engineer, astro gator, and pilot. Well, I just wanted to add, it's probably like steward slash interviewer, because he's probably asking people like, you know, questions about their lives and like, you know, doing small interviews and stuff. He's not just like taking care of them, but okay. trying to garner information. Sure. And what about the rest of our crew? Um, and Dean, where did you think you were going to be? What role did you... I um sort of like security um 
Um, I, I have pilot. I have, I have, a, I have a level in pilot. Um, I don't have any astrogation. Okay. Um, I've got a, I've got mechanic zero. That's as close as I get to understanding how those engines work. Okay. Um, I do have a little bit of combat medic. That's about it. Okay. Uh, and I, I, I can't make a sandwich to yeah. save my life. <laughs> <laughs> so what about uh, the space equivalent of MREs is what you bring <laughs> when it's your night to cook? Um, I don't bring anything. <laughs> uh, Captain Ganny, what about uh, yourself? What do you... Uh, well, I've got jump drive and pilot wow. and uh yeah mechanic three oh, okay well, no, mechanics useless in in a spaceship but um yeah so i've got pilot and jump drive yeah i think an anchor might be your yeah you don't have astrogation no nope. uh, anchor has astrogation our... yeah i guess we'll astrogate have to use well. him in a passive capacity yeah dr yeah. Elias can astrogate as well oh great. all right cool Great, nice. Uh, and then, yeah, and then uh, Anchor's also got Gunner at a decent level too. So you got your uh... well. I mean, you have no guns, so you know that's more of an aspirational <laughs> role. But... <laughs> All right. Uh, so then, um, I guess um, Captain Ganny. Um, Let's assume that you're sort of getting uh, the ship, like uh, whatever the pre-flight cycle, you know, stuff is uh, for this. Um, Dane and uh, Alonzo. Alonzo sounds like he is going to be the more friendly, welcoming, you know, committee, whereas Dane is the, you know, um, it's Max line from uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia of doing the ocular pat down. <laughs> that sort of is. Uh, your role, do I have that right, guys? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so then if um, Alonzo Santaro and or Alonzo and uh, Dane are doing the the uh, pat the uh, check ins, tell us a bit about what you like what you foresee as the um, uh, you know as the process for um, meeting these people and getting them settled in. Uh, it's it also like you can think it, it, this is less. You know, like planning a weekend ahead, like, you know, making appointments and blah, blah, blah. You take who's available, generally speaking, for, you know, for who's coming on board. Um, <laughs> because you need to be able to, Although, in this case, you did have a ton of people who wanted to, to travel to um, uh, Argona. So you did have a lot to select from. So what, what do you guys think? What, what's, what's the process to set up sort of an SOP for how we're going to, you know, role play out stuff in future with uh, the, the travelers? Or the passengers. So well, I think I, oh, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say, I think probably um, Dane probably um, is probably less the face uh, and probably will do like, I, I guess it's the equivalent of baggage checks. Um, uh, so I will sort of, uh, I guess I'll do the manhandling of, of, because they they've all got a allocation of of, of, of of baggage, so um, if if they're mid passage, then I'll I'll bring it in. I'll I'll check. I'll I'll, I'll run checks on all, all that. Um, okay. How do you see that going? Um, I guess we will leave. They can leave their luggage um, effectively, um, almost if if, it's, if possible outside, and I'll just literally I will just manhandle it in or use any sort of spaceport sort of uh robot based what you can assume that. is that um because they're coming from planet remember that the security rating on spurl is pretty fucking high oh, so yeah, right yeah, like yeah, yeah. And there's very unlikely to have any guns that have been made it's that have made its way to the planet unless they are you know master criminals or in some kind of cahoots with gd uh Gidico. uh Gidico. we're not in cahoots <laughs> right, but I think that there's, there is an aspect of it of it being our standard operating procedure, right? Where, yeah. like, even though we think Sprawl is very safe, it's like we still would carefully check their yeah, bags, that's right? Very, yeah, that's very true. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so... Then... I think Alonzo is, like, very friendly and, you know, probably trying to buy people with, you know here's your boarding drink, you know, like we'd have a little bar set up. Like 
he, so, he'd probably try to make it quite nice and comfortable. Let's talk about the else. um uh, the what the available uh space is then uh, because you guys have a kind of a common meeting area. Do I have you on the right page here? I do, thank God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have you on, this is your sort of crew area here, right? Where you guys have the shared um, uh, kind of meeting boardroom and whatnot. And there's one, two, three, three. Uh, there's three staterooms here. Yeah, three staterooms on the and main floor. Who do you think stays nearest the bridge? I mean, I I'm think assuming Captain, Captain Gandhi is one would. of those. Yeah, which one do you yeah. want to lay yep. claim to, Captain? I guess I'll go that. Um, what in the middle? The one in the middle? Okay. Next to the cargo? Okay. And then who is claiming the other two? Which crew members? So they both... Part owner of the ship, Dr. Ilias, will insist on a nice room. Okay. <laughs> you inspect all seven of them or eight of them, and they're exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Although you have had three months to personalize it, so I will be interested in hearing what you guys have, like what, what we're seeing when we walk into these, uh, um, the various crew places. Uh, which one this... did, uh, would you like to be next to the, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, airlock or furthest away from the airlock? Take the one furthest away from the airlock. Okay, so you and uh, Captain uh, Gani have these. Who was taking this one? Well, do we know how... I wish I knew how many ship shares Ank had. Um, do, you, do you know if he put it on his character sheet? I can't I could oh, open yeah, it. Oh, yeah, it could very well be. Let me take a look. I was okay. going to open it and look, because I had two ship shares. So if I had the most ship shares, then I would take it, but... Okay. Uh, I don't see it. I don't want to panic, have... you guys. Does anybody have engineer? Well, I, I've got engineer jump drive. Oh, great. Okay, great. <laughs> I was just saying, like, um... <laughs> Oops. This is like Kingmaker with no healers in the party all over again. <laughs> I think um, I think we've got five passengers, so they'll take up five of the passenger level staterooms. Yep. So if I could take the stateroom that is off the passenger lounge... Yep. Okay. Oh, okay. So down on deck two... Oh, so we would be taking two of, I guess we could use two of those rooms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're I guess I could stay down there too with the passengers because if I'm being the steward and you're sort of security for the passengers, Dane, then maybe me and you are on that floor. Yeah. And then Ank could take the last room uh, by the captain and the doctor. Cam. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, I'm guessing, uh, I was trying to see on this, presumably. Th at the bottom of deck two, that's the hatch that goes down to near the low berths. So it's actually quite far back. Yeah, I mean, looking at the looking at the image, I think deck two is above. Um, yeah, that's what I've always one. pictured with the Far yeah. Trader two. I don't know if it. Uh, I, 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 you can I don't see the blister on top of it. Yeah, exactly. If you look at the picture. Yeah, I think that de deck two is above. Yeah. Uh, but yes, you're right. It, it uh, the way to get up and down is right near the um, the low berths, uh, near the back of the ship, and you sort of have to make your way through the cargo uh, area in order to get to the um, uh, the actual uh, crew the uh, um, cruise area. It's good that it keeps the pass unknown passengers away from the bridge area. Yeah. And uh, common areas like the, as, as a standard, and this is what you guys have right now, you can upgrade over time. As a standard, uh, there are cameras uh, that run for the main areas and for the, like for any of the common areas. So, you know, here, the hallways, uh, and in here. But uh, the bridge, the... Um, uh, I mean, the bridge probably has one as well, just because of a black box kind of situation. Um, but the facilities themselves don't necessarily have them. I don't think there's, at default, there isn't one in the low berths. You've already got, you know, readings. If something goes wrong there, uh, that would tell you. Um, what do you guys use this second room here for? One off of the bridge. I'm guessing... I don't know, astrogation maybe? Could be, yeah. Well, 
or maybe if because i'm guessing what one of those the the two front ones obviously are pilot and co-pilot i'm guessing and then the other two are what engineer and astrogator um I, I imagine astrogation is less of a like second by second thing, so I imagine that might be it would be uh, there'd be a reason to have it set in a separate room. Whereas like the gunner or the um, what do you call? Are there either? Yeah, because you don't have to be in the turrets. It's not like Star Wars style stuff. You just <laughs> need to operate them. Um, the sensor operator or the you know whatever may need to be. Um, I uh, may need to have like you want to be able to be in the same room as that person to directly communicate. Mm -hmm. What do you guys it's think? It's almost like a it's almost like a captain's um, briefing room, isn't it? Almost like off the bridge. It's kind of like you know, big desk. Yeah, yeah. Like when it's important for the captain to be. Although I mean, it's a small crew, but when it's important <laughs> yeah. for the captain to be on the uh, <laughs> on the bridge, you can stand and, and command stuff. Um. Mm. You guys are much more hands-on. This is much more U-Haul than yeah. it is, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so then that's, we, we know where everyone is going to be staying. Which of the rooms, um, Alonso, which one did you claim? Are you nearest the uh, the room here? Uh, the uh, sort of passengers uh, common room? Uh, are you closer to the, you know, the exit here? Yeah. Um... Right in the middle. Probably. Do you want to take the one by the lounge? Um, oh, I guess I could take the one that's connected to the lounge. Makes sense. And yeah. I'll, I'll pass the one down by by the entrance. Yeah, so. why don't you secure the entrance? One of these guys here? So if someone comes in yeah. after our passengers yeah. are right there to protect them. Yeah, okay. I like that. Yeah, and okay. it makes, you know, it, it also, you know, as part of your intro for the people, like, you know, and if you need anything, this is the room you'll find me in. Uh, if you yeah, I'm right me. here off of the, yeah. Okay. Totally. Um, there's a ship, uh, ship wide comm as well too. Uh, but I think at default, it's the sort of like touch the wall and talk kind of thing. It's not Star Trek, you know, touch, uh, things you guys each have communicators and you could probably sync those to be with one another. Um, but it's just as easy to, you know, to target a specific area or a specific person and talk to the entire thing, um, by touching the wall comm unit. And that's, that would be in every, uh, basically in every room, you would have some way of, of communicating directly with everyone else if you're not using your comm. Um, you can assume that the cargo bay is filled to the tits because it is, uh, you guys took uh, everything and it's all sort of piled around so that there is at least some accessibility for your air raft, uh, which is in there. And um, anything else, let's see here, do we need to talk about, oh, uh, the, um, the, you were talking about the welcoming uh, for uh, for people. So, like, do you have a little, like, you know, tiki bar kind of thing set up outside uh, that you welcome people on, Alonzo? Or is it, you know, everyone comes into the, the main room and that's sort of how they, they are welcome to the crew? A lot of these bookings would likely not be in person. It would be, you know, by the space equivalent of email. Yeah, I think that um, the bar would be set up in the sort of passenger lounge area so that, like, I kind of strategically separate the customers from their suitcases so that Dane can sort of do his security uh, without them watching so that it's, <laughs> it feels a little less uh, like we're all over them. You know, I sort of escort them. Oh, no, Dane will take care of your luggage kind of thing, right? And then bring them up to the lounge. Uh, and I'm picturing, like, something more like a... 1950s bar and then like a tiki bar like okay. he you know because he likes the old school america culture like he's probably yep. very uh <laughs> there's a sign outside that says no irish <laughs> yeah <laughs> we could have like a, a small briefing you know for, for, for the passengers you know uh, that's what i was thinking one. yeah yeah you guys would have an orientation kind of unlikely to forget something yeah like yeah totally so probably like escort them all and bring them into that room and, you know, ply them with drinks or whatever their, you know, vice is to try and sort of get them comfortable and give them the big speech, the big onboarding speech. Uh, probably okay. explain to them that Dr. Ilias will have to do his medical. He'll come up for a minute and explain his medical rules for the ship. Okay. Or do we give those passengers medicals as well? Dr. Elias. 
I would I would say so. Any anyone who comes on the ship for a prolonged period could could bring you know risks with them. Right. Have to have I a imagine clean lab or clean ship. Uh, part of your sort of like um, you know whatever your system identification thing is there that would probably be updated uh, on a on a planet like this where it's a corporate thing and there's a lot of travel and there is uh, easy access to, to computers. There's a centralized sort of you know here's the state of their health thing, so you can they have to submit that as mm -hmm. part of their you know, uh, their package. That's not always going to be the case. You guys will be on planets where there's people living in, you know, um, wooden forts uh, where this, the, the uh, you know, the scanning process will be like, I guess that thing doesn't look infected. Come on on board. <laughs> but <laughs> for here, you will have the benefit of having that, yeah. like, you know, that info package coming in. At least all those, the crew members who are, all the uh, crew members, the, uh, tra the uh, passengers who are coming on, you will have access to all of that information from, from them. So unless you want to do a double checking, they do seem to be up to date in their like, you know, space measles vaccinations and things like that. No, in that case, if they have info that says it's all whatever, like a vaccination pass, up, yeah, no, yeah. no double checks. The low birth passengers, I think that some of those may be a little more sketchy and you're going to need to do that for heart conditions and whatever other kind of vulnerable mm -hmm. conditions that may make the freezing and thawing process more dangerous for them. Um. So why don't we do this? Let's get some uh, dice rolling uh, here. Uh, let's go through the... This is just going to be a routine uh, medical check for... Oh, I didn't grab my... Oh, my referee screen. <laughs> Madison, come on. Um, I'll grab that on break. But a routine is a six or higher. You know, I like the... Um, and this is true for both. Like, so I, I got the uh, like limited edition uh, of the core rulebook for this, and I got the same thing for um, Savage Worlds. And the one thing I will say for these things, amazing fucking roll, holy smoke, uh, <laughs> is they lie open so well. Like the the saddle, the, whatever the stitching is they have for these things, it they the books lie open just beautifully. There's no like pushing it to make sure it stays open. Love it. Um, I am a simple creature uh, who <laughs> is made happy by small things. So uh, that is excellent. And what kind of talk over? So the, the people you've got, it looks like it's a mix of people between like mid 20s and uh, early 40s. Uh, these are probably all laborers who are traveling and just need to, you know, uh, get to Argona to get some work done. Um, what's the, you know, uh, their, their uh, traveling stuff is going to be, there's probably a, like an area set aside for their um, whatever, um, luggage that they're bringing uh, with them. Is there anything in particular that uh, Dr. Ilias says uh, before, or Dr. Abdel says before he, uh, you know, and maybe he does go by Dr. Ilias. To how does he introduce himself to the, you know, kind of like the, the kid's dentist, I'm Dr. Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, he'll, he'll do the doctor and first name, which in the part of the world I'm currently traveling in is, is very common. So I think that's quite oh, fitting okay. with his, yeah, it'll be Dr. Ilias. Um, he'll, he'll be quite so brutal about uh, the dangers of, of the travel. He doesn't want to like sugarcoat it or, you know, it'll be very much so that they're clear uh, and also to encourage them not to lie about conditions or, or anything that might be of, of relevance. So just be like, you know, <laughs> you could possibly, he won't be, he'll be like, you could die on this just so you're aware. So please, yeah. you know, this information is, is for your safety. I imagine it's a very firm and friendly kind of uh, delivery. And, yeah. and there's, there's, there should be a little bit of time for them to, if they're at all religious, perhaps to have a moment where they consider, you know, some sort of uh, whatever rites they need, whatever prayers and rites they need before being you know, potentially frozen for the last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, and I think with a role that good, what what's happened is one of them um, actually acknowledges that uh, they're still recovering from some kind of uh, cardiac surgery. Um, and that they needed, there was some special things. It's not going to be a problem. You just need to make sure that you medicate Adjust. before they go in. So, yeah, and I think that happens in front of pretty much all of them. Uh, it's one of the first ones to go in. And it's this, you know, great big, um, his name happens to be Earl Collins. And the, um, uh, what what he tells you, you know, he sort of at first is is gonna you know keep things to himself, and then one of his buddies, a guy named uh, or actually a lady uh, named uh, Martha Anderson, is like tell him, Collins, tell him, and he admits this to you, and you know when when he gets that, um, what what sort of the quick and um, 
Like, I imagine it's not a scolding response from Dr. Ilias. No, that there'll be sort of acknowledging of, well, well done, and thank you for telling me, you know, but honesty is the way forward here. He then probably can't help himself and then all of his training will kick in and there'll be a, a bit of an additional lecture on, you know, we all like to lead a healthier lifestyle and, yeah, yeah. you know, with, with okay. cardiac, cardiac <laughs> episodes, you know, have you considered reducing your salt intake and uh, that sort of thing. So, but yeah, yeah it's, it'll be friendly, you know. Okay. I think but after sure. you do that as well, there's, you know, two others who admit completely unrelated. I had a bit of a sniffle uh, from before and you're like, nope, that'll be fine. And the other one's like, I'm allergic <laughs> to house cats. And you're like, no, no, that's... There, there, there are no cats on board. Quickly yeah. check the cargo manifesto. Yeah, no, there are no cats on board. Okay. So then you, yeah, so you get all your, the low birth passengers uh, secured. And then what are you guys thinking is the process for, uh, like, um, is it just um, Alonzo and uh, Dane who are arriving and then Dr. Elias uh, as well in the, um, for sort of the, you know, passenger orientation uh, onboarding meeting, uh, or are, are there others, uh, Dr. Gan, uh, in particular, Captain Ganny, do you uh, attend that meeting? Or are you kind of the mysterious, you know, man above? Dr. Ganny? Or Captain Ganny? Dr. Ganny? Captain Ganny? Um, I will, I'm not really, uh, well, I have got some diplomatic training, but I think I'll be more focused on making sure the ship's running smoothly, okay. making sure the jump drive's prepared. All of that good stuff. Okay. So then it would be um, Alonzo and Dane who are attending uh, for uh, the thing here. Okay, Carl's out of town this weekend. He's traveling himself. Um, then uh, what... Um, uh, so hi, Carl. Hope you're having a good time out of town. Um, what we... Um, what I'll do then is let me introduce you to the, um, the passengers who are coming on board. Mm. Um, and... I'm going to have to reference... Oh, you know what? I can pull it up on my phone and reference it there. Okay. Um, nope. There it is. Okay. Uh, only because I did write it down, but I noticed that I, I wrote one thing down incorrectly. So, I know, Anna. I got to make a better job next time. I will. I will. Okay, so your passengers are as uh, follows. First up, we have um, Eldon Hobbs. And this is what Mr. Hobbs looks like. Mm -hmm. Eldon Hobbs is clearly a uh, noble from uh, one... Well, he, his... Uh, uh, origin, you know, I'm going to drag her in here because I don't want to bark all day. Ooh. Honey. Hey. There's a little bit of augmentation going on there. Don't we? Yeah. Or he's a vampire. Yeah. Yeah. Good girl, sweetie. Good girl. Good. Thank you. Any special dietary requirements for him? All right, the co DM is here. <laughs> or co referee. Thank you. Can I have my sheets? Thank you, sweetie. All right, so first is um, Elden Hobbs. Elden Hobbs are, uh, hails from the planet of Drinax, which you guys would know as uh, the sort of the uh, last gasp of um, a uh, the Sindalan Empire. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, um, Drinax uh, last session. Um, the feeling of um, the Trojan Reach, is, uh, Trojan Reach as the graveyard of empires is yeah, the, arguably the, uh, the Drinaxi or the last gasp of that. Uh, the fact that someone of that nobility, and there's not really a working class per se from Drinax at this point. There's just a shit ton of nobles that live on a flying city ruled by a very, um, a very outrageous uh, king named King Oleb. Uh, I think Oleb the Fourth, if I recall, um, who uh, are serviced by some, you know, um, servants and whatnot, but. 
Uh, I mention all of this to say that one of the reasons why he looks so unusual is, uh, or his uh, his very unusual coloring is in part because of probably some inbreeding that's uh, very carefully managed by um, genetic engineering, uh, and um, uh, also he um, it's unusual for someone of such station to be traveling on such a relatively modest uh, vessel. Um, so Eldon Hobbs <laughs> is passenger number one. He is uh, 27 years old, uh, or let's say that's 27 years old. Uh, next up is um, uh, Hirkani Skir. Uh, she uh, indicates she is uh, 32 years old, and she is a uh, executive uh, who works for uh, PRQ Corporation, the uh, company that effectively runs Argona. It's the GDCO equivalent of... Uh, um, so that's a uh, local to uh, PRQ. GDCO, still better than PRQ. Um, next is someone named uh, Cassidy Paller. Cassidy is a young go getter journalist who looks like this. Uh, she is an imperial and she is uh, definitely a bit of a busybody. Uh, unless you introduce yourself, Alonzo, as with your sort of credentials or whatnot, she spends a lot of the orientation staring at you, trying to get a like that kind of like, how do I remember that face kind of situation. Uh, the next is a guy named Timber Tallwee. Uh, Timber is, uh, sh uh, he shows as a um, employee of PRQ. Uh, he is uh, actually engineer by uh, trade. Um, and then your final person is uh, perhaps the one who has of the, uh, the most uh, notoriety. It's a guy named um, Errol M uh, Milter. Errol is a 52-year-old mining union representative. Now, uh, let's take a look here at your... Ooh. What skill are we going to use to determine how much you know about sort of the politics in here? And I will take suggestions. Um, I think profession... Do you have profession journalist, uh, Alonzo? I think streetwise might apply as well. I definitely have streetwise. Uh, streetwise. I mean, I've investigate jack of all trades. Jack of all trades. Would definitely apply. Oh, this is for history, though. Yeah. I guess probably streetwise would be the most. Okay. Why don't you give us a streetwise check? Once again, it'll be. Um, I think this one's going to be an eight. So the standard difficulty. <laughs> Yeah. So what you know is that um, I mentioned uh, last time that like the the history of um, labor uh, activity on Argona is pretty impressive to the point where uh, at one point they actually collapsed the uh, ice on top of a bunch of corporate reps and wouldn't let them out until they agreed to certain agreements. This is going back several years now, but like um they don't as they say fuck around uh as far as uh, labor uh, rights are on there and this guy seems to have at one point you know 20 years ago he was a bit of a um a big deal in it but curiously he's been absent like you generally don't telecommute to your position as a union organizer and it seems like he was kind of a uh from the way that uh they talk about it at some point he was a bit of a notorious you know um agitator for uh, for labor rights um i think labor from the labor perspective that would be an advocate for labor rights but you know <laughs> Gideco, we write how things go um <laughs> what um what um yeah so the fact that this this dude is going back sort of 20 years after his glory time um you didn't find anything in the news about that but the guy was at one point a pretty big wheel in the in the labor movement so um uh, the fact that you've got a, a PRQ corporate rep, a PRQ engineer, 
and a uh, this guy who was a union uh, a union activist working against uh, PRQ uh, 20 years ago, all traveling at the same time is just coincidence. Um, you the from the none of them have their you know passages booked at the same time. None of them seem to know one another, and they don't seem to sit with each other either. So as you're getting into um, the thing, and let me I probably have an easier way. Oh, you know what I could do is. Uh, I don't think we need the stats for combat just yet. So why don't I put these folks here? Sounds like it'll be fun, the, the uh, drinks at the start, then. <laughs> oh, most definitely. I think what you find is that um, of the ones here, it's probably uh, Timber. And I'll put the names underneath them, guys, just so you don't have to... These pretend people, you don't have to try and memorize their names. They're or always welcome to join for a drink, Captain. I think what we can say is that there's maybe a um, a scene where you're you know once you've got everyone booked you're going through with your uh, Dean and uh, Alonzo's uh, initial sort of you know uh, information about these guys or these folks. Right, the brief that Kevin just gave is probably what Alonzo briefs the crew with in our little crew area, you know, after everyone's boarded and whatever. Mm -hmm. he would um, be sharing that information mm -hmm. so any comments concerns about uh, the crew you're bringing Just, on no not at all I mean I I think probably Dane would take the view that Errol Melter wasn't working against um, PRQ he was working for them in the sense that he was looking to get uh, sort of fair and proper worker rights to improve, uh, you know, staff retention, to improve all that kind of stuff. So he would probably take a, a fairly warm view to him, but I would he would be interested to know what Errol Mailter's sort of current position is. So he's, you know, okay, so that's his past, you know, um, hot shot sort of union rep, you know, that's, you know, 20 years on, is he still in the same position? I suppose he'll just, he, and he, and he, maybe that'll be a, I don't know if that's an icebreaker is the right word, but maybe I'll just sort of talk to him. About, what the you know. fuck are you going back to Argona for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the bastards. Why would you do that? <laughs> so uh, beforehand, I mean, you would be a little limited in your searches you could do, but if you have, uh, if anyone has uh, training in computers, I think you could probably sort of use the, um, you know, the what uh, database that uh, PRQ has or PRQ that uh, GDCO. Jitico, way better than PRQ's computers. Um, <laughs> what uh, you could do is use the effectively like kind of the database um, at the uh, starport to try and access, you know, if, if there's any other news or whatnot to get a sense of what this dude's been doing. If, if you're mm -hmm. interested, I mean, you, you have, uh, depends on how paranoid uh, you may be. Well, I don't, I'd, I would run a ch check maybe on everyone, unless somebody else has got Dane is going to do it as a security thing, but otherwise I've got computer do, skills. Sir. Yeah, no, it's fine. You go ahead. I'm, I've got, I'm not that hot on computers. I've got electronics. I don't know if that's the okay, same. So thing. let's do this here, just uh, two, and we'll treat it as one. Um, I have a pretty high computer score. Okay. Well, you're in charge of passengers then, so. Let's see if there's so, so maybe I leave it to you. Yeah. Do you want me to roll that cap? Uh, I'm just going to see if there's a, if there is a skill for investigation or for yeah there is a skill called investigate, so yeah, which um, I also have yeah I think that um, computers these are sort of complementary uh, things like one yeah. is is learning how to uh, to do that so um, for investigating is my yeah. jam working together. Is let's see here. I think the way that you get a boon from it, right? Because we were talking about the the they have some clear direction for like when you use modifiers, when you use boons. Oh, so if you have complementary skills, then you would roll with a boon. I was checking here. Okay. 
as it happens, my electronics is actually um, specialised in computers. So I've got, oh, nice. I've got a massive computers one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then, um, why don't uh, whoever wants to give us a computers check? Let's see here. Let's do it as a task chain because that'll be fun. Uh, we'll see what kind of uh, security package you're able to put together with it. Task chains uh, are basically the way it works is uh, one someone makes a check. Uh, this is on page uh, 63 of the 2022 book. Um, you make a check and depending on how well you do on that check, it sets up the next role in the check. So if you guys want to work together on this, I'm fine with uh, the last check being the investigation, the actual uh, checking into this stuff and the computers being sort of like setting up you know, whatever, I, I imagine there's more than just like setting up the criteria for a search thing. It's setting up a more complex algorithm to go through, you know, thousands, if not millions of worlds worth of info and whatnot that's been saved. They sort of say that like memory is kind of not an issue in this setting. It's not really something until you're getting to the like very, very low tech computers. So I imagine there's just a like ungodly amount of information you need to sort through in order to really parse out what you're looking for. So yeah. um, uh, Captain Ganny and Dane, you both said you had uh, good computer checks. Who wants to go first to try and set up? I'm going to just say, hey, hey, Ganny, you, could, you couldn't check through all this uh, mound of data, could you? Just to <laughs> give it a go. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. So an, uh, an eight <laughs> is a success with a zero uh, effect. So that means uh, plus one. Uh, so you'll be rolling uh, plus one to your... Uh, investigate roll there, Alonso. Okay, here we go. Uh, plus one. Oh, oh, yes. nice. Very nice. All right. Uh, so then, um, what? Well, here's what you find out about these types. Um, uh, Hobbs, you can tell. And what? What? Uh, if there's other things you have questions about, you can ask me about them. But I'll tell you at least what one of the things I imagine you look for is. Where they come from? Like, where do they? How do they get to to uh, Spurl in the first place? Um, Timber, Mister Tallwee seems to have been here on vacation. He's been here for a month. Um, he arrived from Argona and appears to be returning to Argona. So he seems to be on a vacation. At one jump away, it's a very popular destination to go. And even if it's a little colder, it's not a giant ice mining planet. So it is a comparatively uh, you know, parad uh, paradise-like uh, planet to, to visit. And he seems to be in middle management enough to be able to afford that kind of, uh, you know, fairly uh, luxurious uh, location. Um, Hobbs uh, has come by way of a couple of destinations. He arrived on Spurl at, with the intent on going to Argona next. It seems that this is part of his... Uh, uh, his regular uh, sort of travel itinerary. What you've done as well is sort of massaged. I wouldn't say that you've hacked necessarily, but you've definitely got into some of the um, more questionable uh, parts of the security database for uh, that Jitico maintains on here. Uh, Jitico, we always know where you're going. Um, so you've got that information to be able to track back what the, like when they went through customs and, and whatnot. One of the upsides for being such a high security planet is they do have a lot of paperwork for that kind of stuff. Paller uh, appears to have been on planet for about uh, three months or so, and it's not clear where she came from before. Oh, I know, sweetie. Can you come up? Um, so she, it's, it's not clear how long she, uh, it's been more than three months since she arrived on planet. Uh, Milter likewise has come through, uh, from, um, outside of the, um, the, what is it, it's the borderland cluster, uh, as has, uh, Skir. Uh, both of them have been on planet for about maybe two weeks at different times they arrived. So you've got Paller arriving, uh, although Skir arrived shortly before Melter did. Melter, um seems to have only been um I, it's not clear what he's been doing there's you know there's a a hotel he's been staying in you rolled quite well so if you want to investigate sort of what's been going on it appears that someone's paying for his hotel so someone uh put him up somewhere for a time and then he and, uh, but as I said, he and Skier booked their their travel at a separate time. Same thing with Tallweed. 
So that's what you know about the travel stuff. Is there anything else that you specifically would want to be looking into? So I would be giving that sort of dossier of information to the captain. Um, and I'm not sure if he shares that with the doctor, but only if they asked me to look further into the passengers. Um, I see our destination and this like arrangement we're in, and that's the adventure he's looking for. He doesn't see these passengers as like adventure people. They're like corporate people and, you know, union busters and boring. Mm. He's, he doesn't think they're very, uh, adventure worthy at this point. So that's, he would just do that background check for the crew. And then if the captain, captain, anything you see of concern here, want me to look into oh, deeper. No. I'm busy tinkering away, looking at my uh, jump drive dials at the moment, so... Yeah, you won't even look at the papers I'm, I'm putting in front of them, yeah. <laughs> I think, um, passengers pay the for the, f uh, the fuel, apart from that, I uh... <laughs> So then I'd probably give the, the pa things to Dane after the captain has, you know, to put on file or whatever for his security. Yeah, I think, I think I think for Dane, I uh, remember Dane was born to a lower echelon family on an industrial world, Albi. So actually for, for him, somebody like Errol is probably as close to a hero because um, he's he's kind of seen seen what happens when corporations just exploit workers. So um, what he would he be interested in, just if there's anything on the records about what his current his current work assignment is, if he has a work assignment, that yeah. can be determined. So the, the, the interesting thing is, um, this is 20 years out of date. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, I, I, I think that the, the labor, um, movements or the, the sort of the, the life that a lot of the miners are living on, uh, on Argona, uh, it is a very, uh, it is cognizant of history, but it is very much in the what are you doing for me now kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, so what you do find is there is some some information. This guy was a, a big mucky, like he was a big deal on Argona. Like there's lots of uh, older um, news articles you can find, particularly because it's in kind of the borderland uh, cluster that it's... Um, I'm actually, I'm thinking I'm using the wrong phrase for it. I can't remember what the, the cluster here is called, but I think it borderland cluster will do for now. Um, there is a bunch of uh, a bunch of news articles about this this guy and about the sort of him as a rallying point for a lot of uh, um, uh, folks. It seems he left as part of a, a settlement. He seems to have left Argona as part of a settlement. Um, because you rolled so well though uh, for Alonzo, he did find that there was very briefly um, after he left, there was someone. There were accusations among some of them that basically he sold out the union to get himself set up in a nice place. You know, he's off world. He's living a, a life of uh, comfort and luxury. And this is the shit he left us with. This is the shit agreement he left us with. Um, that didn't seem to go anywhere. And uh, you can't tell... I think maybe Alonzo, with your reporter's instincts, you think that it either means that this is just someone who's, you know, full of shit and there's nothing, there's no substance to that, or it's something that was quashed by perhaps both PRQ and the union to uh, satisfy whatever resolution that they came to that led to Errol leaving Argona. As for why he's going back, um, Mm, I think you'd have to do another little bit of investigation uh, only because you're looking at something different um, to try and find out what his, uh, you know, what he would have to register one of the, again, like, like the high security world. If he's going to work for the PRQ, there's certain like certifications and whatnot that you'd have to have. Um, that's actually six over. So Alonzo, if you followed up on that, um, he does have his, that he was lapsed for two decades, but he has recently reactivated his uh, membership in the Argona Mining Union and his certifications for it, the sort of um, space mining equivalent of Red Seals and, and uh, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I would have definitely, if Dane had, had mentioned that uh, Errol was a bit of a, you know, a mm -hmm. hero and he'd like to know more about him, I would have done the digging for him. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would come with that, like, you know, a real nice full uh dossier for errol uh, yeah especially like giving him a chance to like maybe even including some talking points of like 
you know, if this is someone you want to converse with while we're traveling, yeah, uh, it's good to, you know, have a bit of information. No one said anything about this guy in, in 19 years, in uh, as far as you can tell. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Bit of an enigma yeah. for the last 20 years. Yeah, out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah. Maybe how he's run out of money. How does that affect uh, Dane's... Yeah, quite possibly. Uh, well, how does that affect Dane's view of this guy as kind of a folk hero, an Argona folk hero? Well, yeah, okay. So uh, maybe not, maybe not. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, he's a passenger, he's paid, or oh, somebody's paid. Um, um, I've seen worse. I've seen worse in my career. So, you know. Mm. But I'll, I'll probably I'll probably spend a little bit of time over the course of the week, mm. um, just just gently testing him out, okay. seeing where he's coming from. So he, um, I think, uh, Dean, you'll, you'll get um, uh, an impression. He likely uh, is one of the first to arrive. Actually, uh, Talvi is probably the first to arrive, just because he's um, mindful of being back at work. Uh, Talvi. Uh, gives the surface impression and I'm gonna tell you guys a surface impression you make you can feel free if you've got a Skill you want to kind of press a little further about that you can do that surface impression of this guy is he is a very meticulous uh, individual um, he uh, you'd, you'd think a little bit of arrogance as well um, Carries himself and you know when, when you're explained you know that the, what what the process is that you leave the bags with you You know and you'll bring everything in and, and deliver them to the room he kind of uh, looks like he might question it, but then, you know, I think you've got your Space Marine glare set to about a four out of 10, and that's more than <laughs> sufficient for him to be like, yeah. this is the process, okay. <laughs> you know, and then he makes his way, and he's dressed quite nicely, you know, he, he, it's, uh, it is the casual, you know, mid-level, um, not executive, but like mid-level corporate employee kind of chic. Uh, something he likely picked up just before this vacation in order to look relaxed yeah. and whatnot. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so then he makes his way onto the uh, onto the ship. Uh, second to arrive would be uh, Errol. And uh, you need not make any kind of like, you know, sensory check whatsoever to smell the alcohol coming off of him. Um, he seems to have, uh, whatever the uh, Spurl equivalent of the pre-flight lounge is, he has definitely taken advantage of that. Um he walks up and he's got his clothes are nice, but they're old. Um, his luggage is nice, but it's old. Um, so he walks up and he uh, looks. <clears throat> so you're the bag man then? That's me. All right. Got to have a lemon some way. Puts it down and uh, doesn't give it a thought whatsoever. The way he tosses it down um explain some of the dents and you know scuffs and whatnot yeah. on this very nice piece of luggage that he was uh using mm -hmm. and without you know uh, he gives the impression of um uh you know that that sort of like uh, you know uh aging uh working class fed up with it all kind of demeanor uh that is precisely what he has yeah. is everything is ex is exasperating to him but whatever this is just life so he puts it down makes his way up into the uh, uh, into the uh, uh, ship. Um, Cassidy is probably next to arrive. Uh, she is a very keen uh, individual. Oh, sorry, T uh, Tolby is not the first to arrive. It would have been Cassidy that would have been first. Cassidy would have been first. She just strikes you as an eager beaver. Uh, she's very friendly. Um, and um, the, yeah, that, and that's it. I don't think she has anything else to say. Uh, Errol would have been next, then it would have been Hobbs. Uh, Hobbs gives the impression of a very out of his depth noble. If you think of um, any archetypical, you know, British television of befuddled aristocrat is kind of what <laughs> he would be giving off. Yeah, hopefully he's not Bertie Worcester, but yeah. I guess. <laughs> it's very not true. Like he, he happily goes along with when you tell him you need to do this because okay. he clearly has never done this before. So he oh. leaves his materials. He's like, do you need me to open them for you? Or there are no, security... No, 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 no. You just, you just uh, welcome aboard. Just um, um, go through and my colleague uh, uh, Alonzo will, uh, will guide you through. And he's in there, is he? He, he straight through. Straight through. And you then it's... You can't miss him. Alonzo <laughs> is, is who I'm looking for? Yeah, uh, he'll find you. It's all right, in you go. Alonzo will find me, so I should wait for him then. 
No, 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 just, 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 just go. Just go, just go and wait, but also look for him and he will find me. Um, Mr. Hobbs, come with me. <laughs> <laughs> you bring him up and into the uh, yeah. the uh, ship yeah. and, and uh, hand him off to uh, along or show him where the stairs are to lead up. Yeah. I picture that you've left the um, the whatever they are, the airlock doors that are on the two ones in the um, in the hallway on deck two. I imagine that Alonzo, yeah. you've left those open so people can know what's going on. Okay. And then uh, uh, next is um, Miss uh, Skier, and uh, she is all business. She has the hurried, you know, um, and uh, serious demeanor that only really like corporate types or officer corps have, you know. Um, so she, when you d instruct her to, to leave the, the stuff there, she gives it a look, gives you kind of a look to make sure you're, you know, to sort of sizing up like, some fucking guy stealing bags at the uh, starport. But, uh, you know, the ample amount of security supplied by Judico. Judico, your bags are always safe. Uh, they, um, she leaves them uh, with you and then makes her way onto the ship. And last to arrive is Tolly. And uh, I don't think you guys necessarily have a, like, we're leaving at four o'clock kind of thing. But he's really kind of pushing it. So he is the last to arrive and has the exact same demeanor. So that's the order that you've met everyone. Um, Skier, yeah, again, no nonsense, um, but, um, you know, and seems attached to her, whatever her little pocket, you know, computer thing is. Um, one of the things you would know is because um, wh while there is a, um, you know, uh, I guess actually messages would be leaving at the same time you guys are there isn't a faster way of getting there. So like trying to get messages off before, unless there's a courier ship in orbit that's about to leave before you guys, messages are gonna get there at the same time as you guys. So it's not like they need to get that email off before you know the uh, the flight restrictions come in, but uh, she still acts like that. And the last person is, uh, is Talby, who has that exact demeanor that I, I described before. That's also the order that these people would be arriving in the lounge, Alonzo. And when the word uh, or the offer of free booze, I think Cassidy at first, again, if you don't introduce yourself as, you know, who you are, she just is kind of giving a look to you, uh, trying to figure out where she knows you from. I'd probably be just being introducing myself by my first name. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So she's going to look at you, trying to figure out what it is, uh, accepts the drink and then sits down. Um, shortly afterwards is when Errol will show up. And yes. uh, Mr. Melter, uh, he saddles up to the bar with the uh, certainty as if he doesn't intend on leaving anytime soon. Yeah, he actually like pulls one of the chairs over to the actual bar. Yeah, so he is yeah. happy to have you uh, introduce uh, everything or take as many drinks as he can to get things going. And yeah. like Dane noticed too, uh, it seems like he this is continuing on. A trend started earlier before he boarded. Uh, next to arrive would have been Hobbs, uh, which Dane actually curiously brought up. I'm not sure you've seen any, him bring anybody up before. Uh, right. <laughs> he actually gets get managed to get himself settled in fairly well. Skier is the fourth to arrive, uh, who re uh, refuses uh, any alcoholic drinks, will accept something non-alcoholic, which I think Dr. Ilias uh, uh, keeps stocked on board. So she has a drink, but then uh, sits uh, kind of on her own and is, um, you know, busy uh, with something on her her kind of tablet computer. And the final one to arrive is Talwi. Talwi accepts a drink as well, but sits uh, kind of on his own. Yeah. Um, and he gives sort of the judge. I think he sits at a table nearest where Skier is, but not at the same table as Skier. So, Alonzo, what's the welcome that you give for all these people? Tell us a little bit about what uh, these folks are to expect. Um, I actually think that, um, he would tell, he would probably talk a little bit about himself, uh, and the crew. Maybe he's got like little bios of the crew, um, that he does, you know, like a little history, sort of the little blurb that we would give about our characters at the start of the session. Yeah. Not too long. Maybe he goes into a little bit about Dr. Ilias, like, you know, He's our renowned 
genetic scientist and blah blah blah. And so, How proud is Alonzo of his previous work? Like, I, I'm is he the type to to name drop sort of the stories he's worked on? Like, is he kind of a is his ego? I think he would, I think he would gloss over the journal stick part a little bit, but he has his first novel there behind the bar, and he'll mention it. And, you know, copies <laughs> like are thirty six copies of him. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> And they're signed, you know, like yeah. stuff like that. Right? You guys like may not he's... realize, but an entire ship share went into buying those things to give them, <laughs> yeah. a, you know. That's yeah, why we have new guns. We don't have a Gideon Bible. We have a copy of your novel in every single. <laughs> every <book. person>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then he sort of he would like you know, he would be talking about like I think that he's like. He's so anxious for this sort of adventure to begin that I think that like that would bleed into the the intro okay. a little bit like, oh, and we are definitely out here to find adventure that kind of thing. Oh, but not on this week. This is the this will be just a peaceful you know like he's yeah, just yeah. sort of like backtracking every time he sort of injects the the uh, adventure part, but he can't help but sort of get into it right like. So oh, we got one, some... one of the things that I found out of um I can't, I can't remember if it was one of the TAS journal um things that mongoose pup kickstarted recently uh, or if it was the companion but there's some interesting um reputation rules and a kind of like favors rules that they've introduced so tra mm. traveler for those listening at home um who may not have played traveler before traveler does not really have an xp system your characters enter play and that's how they remain you don't it's not like other games where you're getting points and advancing them and whatnot there are optional rules for doing that kind of stuff and we'll probably do that because you know, um, yeah, for seeing mechanical advancement is something that's fun in games as well. And I don't think it'll break the game to have a very gradual and slow improvement of things. But as a more tangible and regular benefit, these reputation rules are kind of neat because you can, with the different factions that you guys are going to meet over the course of the adventure, you'll have an opportunity to sort of cultivate that stuff and see game mechanic benefits come from cultivating those reputations. Uh, so, um, but I mentioned that because I'm going to make a reputation check uh, for you, Alonso, to see if Cassidy is able to put together who you actually are. Mm. What cool. is your uh, society, by the way? Um, let me see. My social is a 10. 10. Okay, so that's a... So it's... Plus one high. modifier or plus two modifier? Uh, it's a plus one. Plus one, okay. Okay, so... She's got that look of, um, you know, uh, as she's enjoying her uh, her uh, beverage, she's kind of staring at you and trying to figure out, she hasn't put two and two together. You were a big deal on a very populous planet and maybe some of the surrounding things, but it's not like you're sector-wide known, right? Uh, so right. this isn't a, like, a, you know, published everywhere kind of thing. You're a big fish in a, not a small pond, but, a, you know, even a planet of a billion, it's still kind of penny ante when you're dealing with hundreds if not thousands of worlds across the sector right of course right so um so she hasn't put it two and two together yet um he thinks he thinks she's just like interested in him <laughs> for sure yeah so he's like probably to throwing some little flirts out there during the uh, conversations right yeah I think um, of the passengers, uh, when you have your kind of Q and A uh, session, we can assume that Dr. Ilias, you would uh, join uh, at some point as well. Mm -hmm. um, the the main part of the uh, oh, I guess one thing I wanted to mention as well, I, I should have said this at the outset, but for those listening at home too, we're not going to necessarily go through this every time. We have not seen what the ship is like yet, and what sort of the procedures are going to be and whatnot. So I really want to give an opportunity for everyone to kind of feel out the ship and feel out how their what their place is going to be on it and how they're going to deal with NPCs, so that I can judge in future kind of how this stuff is going to go but um well, i think it also gives us an opportunity if you introduce uh certain npcs or whatever where we may know at what point we want to interject like oh during the orientation i want to speak with this new passenger or whatever. exactly this way i can kind of shorthand what oh you'll be introducing this or that or whatnot and um there's also in one of the tas journals there's an interesting thing of generating um uh events during the trip and i've used that uh, to generate some, to make this an interesting trip. Not as a diversion from uh, necessarily from whatever adventure you're on, uh, and every trip doesn't need to be this way, but if you want to make your first trip out interesting, for instance, it's a pretty cool little uh, set of rules for uh, livening up without like derailing the entire, you know, uh, the entire trip. 
because uh, there aren't rules. Uh, there are rules for once you're in system and they're for generating re encounters and when you're on a starport for encounters, but there had not been ones for during the trip. So what um, the person who has the most questions for you guys is definitely Mr. Hobbs. Uh, Hobbs does seem like, uh, I think at one point he might mention that, uh, you kind of mutter that he normally would have people to help with this. Is this someone who normally travels with, it seems, um, you know, uh, uh, like a bag man or, you know, a, uh, a servant of some kind and for some reason has, is not traveling with one now. Uh, he's 27 years old, but he definitely gives the, you know, the, um, you know, the wide-eyed, oh God, where am I, you know, kind of impression of like a lost 16 year old. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that uh, Tolwy um, is quietly getting more exasperated by this process and by Hobbes's um, constant questions. Errol is quite happy to, you know, at one point turn around and, and kind of glare at this guy like, is this your first time off world boy? And I think I would, if I was noticing the other passengers being annoyed, I think that I would uh, intercede and let Hobbs know that like, oh, we have some, you know, a more in-depth orientation we can do after and like sort of um, derail him from uh, derailing the this this thing like too much, right? Like oh, yeah. I would step in and maybe I'd even hint that it's like, you know, for a small fee, you know, like we can really take care of you kind of thing. Like we can up the level of your experience here kind of thing. Uh, I'd hint at that. If, if you hint at that, what you pick up is like, he seems very deflated and uh, says, no, 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 that, that, that will be fine. I, I don't wish to be any trouble. Mm. Um, you get the sense this is someone traveling on a budget for the first time, perhaps in their life. Right. So, um, with the, uh, unless there is anything that uh, Alonzo, Dr. Elias, or uh, Dane wish to um, you know, dive into, that that is otherwise the extent of the uh, orientation. Um, Mr. Talwi, uh, Ms. Skier, um, and um, Mr. Hobbs will go over and ask you know you questions, but uh, Mr. Talwi and Ms. Skier will disappear to their uh, accommodations. I think same thing for Ms. Powler. Um, Leaving Errol the only one kind of like, I thought this was a party. So if you stay in, and uh, drink with him, he'll he'll be happy to to uh, to keep you uh, and Dane and Doctor Elias company. I mean, you probably have other things you need to do, but uh, he's got Alonzo will Alonzo will like he'll let everyone else go off, but he'll entertain Errol as long as he wants to hang out. Okay, um, he is. It seems um, intent on getting like not blackout drunk, but v like two doors down from that is, right. yeah, is what yeah. he if he uh, goes on. Um, After about his tenth drink, I switch to some really cheap whiskey, but I tell him it's you know, oh, this is some good old you know yeah. earth quality. You don't even need to get that far. I think like uh, six, seven drinks deep. Uh, oh, because you guy, said he was drinking before he got here. He was drinking before he got here, and yeah. it seems like this guy doesn't hold his liquor the way he... Uh, if you let him talk, he's, again, one of those guys who, like a, a referee, who wants to talk all the goddamn time and not let the players talk. Uh, he is uh, one of those guys who just wants to tell you his stories from back in the day, you know, kind of thing. Um, and it seems as if the... Every back-in-the-day story that he has to tell unsurprisingly seems to date from about two decades ago mm -hmm. um, if you do gently nudge the conversation in a way uh, to um, more recent stuff he sort of like ca casts it off very very like someone who is is used to sort of downplaying whatever he does now and redirecting the conversation back uh, oh, okay you know and he t spends a lot of time yapping about um, that time back in the day, you know, oh, blah, blah, this, and uh, he very quickly gets into kind of the, you know, very negative uh, against PRQ um, stuff and uh, the the shit they pulled and all this and that and whatnot, like um, a guy reliving his glory days. And the more drunk he gets, um, 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it because it is a nautical term too. I love that. Um, what, um, yeah, what uh, he gets a little kind of maudlin about them too. Like he's got no stories that, that are more recent than, you know, when he was in his 20s or 30s, I suppose. He's, he's uh, 57 right now, 52 right now. So, yeah. Uh, and then he'll drink himself to the point where he needs to be put to bed and uh, um, you will need to kind of help him along. Um, this has the, if this guy was a heavy drinker at one point, he is not able to handle it any longer. Yeah, I'll put a bucket by his bed or something. You know? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, see him off to the, the berth. Um, Dane, I was going to ask you to do, I think it's recon is what I want. I think recon is the sort of like insight type ch uh, skill here. Scout out dangers and spot threats, unusual objects or out of place people. That would have been good to have. Okay. Oh, do you um, not have it? Sadly not. <laughs> Does anybody have recon? Yes. Oh, so uh, Dr. Elias, do you wish to... Actually, you know what? I got an interesting way of, of tying this in. Why don't you give us a recon check? Mm, okay. Nice. Well. So there is something... Um, there is something that sort of uh, stands out for you, and that is uh, the medical history that Ms. Skier has submitted. Um, there's nothing that stands out about it that's necessarily, you know, problematic or, you know, any red flags or anything like that. But there is one curious thing. So this is someone, she, as you understand it, she is a, um, a corporate, like, you know, mid-level executive with uh, PRQ. What she has on her medical history that you would know, um, because you you know keep up to date on all of your allies, one of the things that you will find with Dane and Captain Ganny and um, uh, Anchor's uh, medical histories is they have an ungodly amount of vaccinations against a wide variety of different things. Um, the uh, e even in the uh, far future of the uh, third Imperium, uh, their approach is vaccinate them for everything and then we can figure out whether they get exposed to it afterwards, you know, in the in the various branches of the military. Um, Miskir has a very extensive vaccination history uh, and it seems to be from, she uh, is um, 32 years old and her vaccination history from about... 14 years ago to about 10 years ago seems to be extremely extensive. Like there's a thing where she just got a crap ton of, uh, they don't give you the, the, the location for it, but it tells you mm -hmm. all the different things that she's been vaccinated against. Um, if you spoke to someone who might know more about like those particular types of uh, threats and whatnot, they may be able to give you some additional insight as to whether it's, you know, um, what organization and what location that might be. There seems to be more to Miss Scare's history than what she is at the first appearance. Interesting. Are the types of vaccinations similar to the ones Dane would have in his background? So, in, in terms okay. of the number of them, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that the things that, uh, and in fact, um, more so with Dane. That well, I guess you know what because the the. Uh, spread of, of illnesses, uh, you know, and you need to get from planet to planet on ships. The Navy uh, probably has the same level of, you know, widespread uh, vaccination uh, applications. So, yeah, it, it would be comparable to what uh, you would see with your all your military background allies. Interesting. Well, we won't have a past in and of itself. It's uh, He'll make a mental note of it. I might... Once we have like a crew meeting, maybe after we take off, he might make mention of it to Dane sure. as sort of like, you know, might be ex-military, yeah, just out mm -hmm. for your information. He would be interested in Eldon Hobbs, because if he comes from a line of people that do genetic engineering to keep their, their culture, I've that's obviously very much in keeping with his last uh, attempts at... Uh, yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, something I very think, similar, so... Yeah, from, from an act, I think like on, on the face of it, it's not hidden that there is a... 
uh, there is a very conscious effort to maintain. It's it's crazy that you know the um, with the knowledge of the of genetic engineering and and uh, you know her, um, uh, inheritable traits and stuff like that that people would care that much about bloodlines still, but they do. And these people, it seems as if uh, there is a great effort uh, for um, tracking. Not only do you have access to him, but because it's it, it's kind of part and parcel with his. Um, his information uh, tracks back like 1,600 years worth of uh, ancestors. <laughs> He's clearly part of the nobility on Drinax, and there's a great effort to make sure that that uh, one of the things is with your bloodline, even if you're going to be marrying in with cousins and whatnot too, because of the genetic engineering, you're able to get away from the pitfalls of that. You know, uh, there there isn't a Drinaxi equivalent of the Habsburg chin, for instance. <laughs> so. So it would be very unusual for someone from his background to be traveling almost incognito like this. Definitely. And and also, I mean, if he is someone who is, is intending on traveling incognito, he's fucking awful at it if you speak to Dane. <laughs> you know, like the impression you get is like this guy is just, unless there is a elaborate con for him to be floundering and not know how to do any of this stuff, it's a really conspicuous traveler. And it is a very... Um, it, w what possibly could it hide? Maybe, you know, those who are more conspiracy-minded like Alonzo may be able to fill you in on that. But this guy just seems like, you know, a um, <laughs> inbred royal abroad. Um, and there is some fascinating, like, the, the amount of, um, just from a, a strictly scientific perspective, Sindal was, like, the level of technology that Sind the Sindal and Empire had is comparable to current high, like, bleeding-edge kind of tech from the Empire. Not quite, but fairly close. So it's ingenious. Like, this is for um, uh, a an empire that arose and fell during the Dark Age uh, between the, uh, yeah, the uh, what is it, the Rule of Man, the Second Imperium, and the Third Imperium. These people had f a phenomenal grasp of... Uh, genetic engineering so perhaps i'm reading to do later then excellent yeah so then um guys why don't we uh why don't we take our mid session break right now i'll refill our beverages i'll let Anna banana uh, outside so we can wear off some energy and then uh we'll come back and uh we'll see if we can get the far trader into orbit and then have your first crew meeting as you move your, yourself into it'll take about a, a month for you to get into position because uh, remember, you can't just go into orbit and then juke, you know, zork out. You need to move to a uh, away from the gravity wells. Is that right, or am I thinking BattleTech? No, no, you Battle do Tech. need to get out of the uh, yeah the gravity uh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be yeah, because I think oh hold on, maybe it's not yeah. a month. Uh, that's probably like a few days. Uh, a few, a few yeah. days. Okay. I can't oh. think of that. I was reading BattleTech. Depending this on week. the size of the planets, yeah. Okay, um, so then we will uh, we'll take our, our mid-session break. We'll be back in about five minutes, folks, and then we will see what happens next. The world's first...
Okay. You know, while we're waiting for everyone to get back, I will mention as well, um, there is a supplement for Tra Mongoose Traveler first edition called Supplement 7, 1001 Characters. Uh, that is super fucking cool. And it's got, uh, it was really, really helpful for trouble, just uh, either t uh, stealing whole heart, uh, whole holy, or just uh, um, brainstorming for ideas for random uh, characters or random people who meet. There's a separate one for patrons that's also quite good. But for, um, yeah, for for just like grabbing and, and filling, populating, you know, either passengers or people they meet on the, on the spaceports or whatever, a really, really cool supplement. I like it quite a bit. Mm. Yeah, I think this has been a great setup for murder mystery, so I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who gets it first? And <laughs> I see you classic, played a game you know, with me before. All on board the Orin Express. <laughs> exactly. You are going to Express. Yeah, I figured it would be like, what better way to, I mean, the the, um, the rules from, um, what do you call it, for, or the uh, rules for like uh, shipboard events got my, my mind going. And then I stole a couple ideas for the, the passengers from that 1001 thing. And then it's just one of the, I, uh, something I love and I forgot about uh, playing Traveler is just the emergent story that the sort of, with the random elements that come together, it just this great way is fucking super, super fun. And it makes the game very different from others where, because like, have a, it's like Call of Cthulhu in the sense that not having um, a game of building your character and developing your character means the total game is playing, is the you know the travel stuff, the reputation stuff, the building up the ship, the getting money, the just playing your your uh, travel or getting into adventures. That's the totality of the gameplay to engage with, not you know um, deciding what you're going to get at level three or level four or, mm. you know, what you're going to spend your points on. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It just means we're a very different uh, play experience. So I uh, like it. It means, uh, yeah, I can uh, lean heavily into the role playing and stuff like that. So then, guys, um, one thing's uh, so basically uh, looking at, at the thrust rating for your ship and the, uh, the rough size of Spurl, it's probably going to take you about maybe 12 hours to get into oh, the jump point. So it's, it's, I was, the months thing or days thing I was thinking of is, is Battletech, um, the, but it, they've got the same basic principle that you can't be near a gravity well when you, you know, do your faster than light travel. Um, with everyone, uh, I guess, what is the, um, uh, the boarding criteria? Oh, Graham, I lost your camera. I'm not sure if that was intentional. Oh, there you're back. There you go, I'm moving again, yeah, okay. <laughs> you're back, but you were frozen <laughs> briefly. <laughs> like either Graham, Graham's being very stoic or there's a, a tech issue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then, oh guys, um, as uh, everyone's getting, what, what's sort of the, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, unless you insist on otherwise, Alonso, that uh, Errol will, will like, happily stay, you know, he'll strap himself into a, the, you know, one of the, the chairs or whatever in the lounge. Uh, but he ain't going nowhere, and he's going to try and not spill his drink, you know, when uh, he takes off. Um, Yeah, I mean, if we have, like, launch-ready chairs in the lounge, I would probably just make sure he's sitting down and strapped in and whatever. And I'm picturing it's got... kind of, you know, it's like fold-down stadium seating kind of things. I'm, I'm picturing it's kind of like that. Yeah. And I'm also like imagining we've even got like coasters that sort of hold your drink to the table or whatever. So <laughs> yeah. we're ready to go. All right. Uh, everyone else gets set up in their berths. Uh, and then Captain Ganny, the weather is, is quite lovely on Spurl, so you're not going to need to make any pouting checks to get yourself up. It's only in high winds or, you know, bad weather. Uh, landing is a little more challenging, but getting it into the air, that's that's a, a piece of cake. <laughs> uh, so then... Um, Tell us a little bit, Captain Ganny, what is your, uh, knowing that you've got sort of like the ability to do, you know, shipwide comms kind of thing, is there any announcement you make as a part of your standard protocol for taking off into orbit? Oh, I think, uh, you know, I've been thinking on this uh, as we we're talking on this thing. I mean, Captain Ganny is a man who's is come from, like, uh, Dane Lovray, he comes from a very modest background and he's very down to earth. He's got a 
you know, his background is so wide that he fits in very well in any starport. You know, he fits in with the Navy, the uh, scouts, uh, you know, um, merchants, a whole lot. And he's very much a, a man of not too many words and viewed as very straight by people. He's uh, mm. a, a straight shooter. So he'll be very matter of fact as he gives the announcement, you know, that uh, of the of the imminent takeoff. You know, he'll give her 10 minutes to take off and and address that to uh, Alonzo and Dane. Okay. Um, 10 minutes before. Dane and uh, Dr. Ilias, where would you, um, where do you think you position yourselves uh, for, for takeoff? When does the astrogation need to happen? Once uh, we reach orbit or before we even... Yeah, it needs, as soon as you get into, into orbit, you can plot it. It's an easy no. uh, four or higher astrogation check that takes 1d6 times 10 minutes, modified by education. Um, so you can take 1d6 hours instead to get a plus two, but... I oh, yeah, right, because probably Probably good to go anyway because it's quite easy isn't it that's a good point the um i don't know if this is true for all versions of traveler but uh the second edition has this fucking great uh uh sliding scale mechanic for doing things quickly or taking time with things uh which you can find on page 62 of the 2022 update uh so if a task takes a certain amount of time I mean, this is only for, for tasks that can benefit from taking extra time, but going from to, uh, D10, if it's D6 hours, that will give you a um, plus two. But you can only move a, a time increment one level this way. So there you go. So that's as good as it can get. But that's true for other tasks. So if you guys um, are, are thinking of like things in particular that you're bad at, uh, if you want to try and improve the chances with that, you can always just take more time. Nice. Mm. Like as I think Dr. Ilias will be giving one last check over the low berth, making sure all the lights are green and, and everything is, is as it should be. Mm -hmm. And then we'll head to... He'll, he'll probably not having traveled much, he'll probably be in, in, in the in the bridge for takeoff just to sort of get that, that view of a planet slowly shrinking below and getting that, that sort of nice view as, as, as we take off. So it's something he has experienced very mm -hmm. often. Before we move off of the planet two, um, why don't we treat it this way with the, the time modifier thing. Dane, why don't you give us a recon check? Basically, you're gonna make an unskilled check, but you're gonna get plus two to it. So it'll be whatever, sure. and then you get to add your, um, let's see here, what would be the modifier? Uh, I think intellect, probably. What do you think? Okay, so, so if, I, if I do that, if I click intellect, yeah. And I get a modifier of net minus one, would that be then? The net minus one is perfect. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. Let me submit that now. Okay. Okay. Oof. Yeah. And uh, do you don't have a do you have an intelligence modifier normally? Uh no. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So you look through and uh based on that level of success, what you you cannot find anything hinky in any of their you know, any of their supplies. Unsur you know, unsurprisingly, there's no weaponry in here. Like, um, Spurl is so uh, restricted in its, um, you know, uh, in its uh, security levels and law levels that no one brought even like a pen knife uh, with them on this. But everything okay. is, is pretty much what you expect. If there's something in particular you want to sort of snoop in a little further for any of the uh, travelers, you're, f you're free to, but everybody seems to be presenting um, their, their luggage at least suggests that it's the same thing that they present. There's nothing, uh, of, yeah. you know, no bombs, no, um, you know, I whatever. Say, I do have explosives. So one of the things, you know, I'll be looking for, well, I'm not looking for, but I'll probably scan for is, 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 sure. is something that might blow us up. Uh, now, um, that's a good opportunity to talk about sensors in the game because it's not like, um, you know, one of the, this is one of the fun things with, uh, sci-fi RPGs and figuring out what specifically you can expect. Like, can you tricorder this stuff or or not? And I don't think there is. There isn't a tricorder uh, equivalent. Let's see here. There's bio, because they're the type, it, it's a sci-fi game of the 80s, so it's the future that is limited by the perspective of, of that <laughs> thing. But what it does is it, it uh, specifies what types of things you can scan for. Like, the whole thing of, um, there is a bio uh, scanner that uh, sniffs for organic um, molecules and test chemi chemical samples, but there isn't kind of a, like, I'm detecting six life forms, Captain, kind of thing that you see in Star Trek. 
uh, sensors can detect, if you look on page 160, uh, that gives you an idea of what the, the type of sensors on a ship can, can actually pick up. And so you're limited to like the densitometer, uh, what is NAS? Neural activity scanner. It detects neural activity and intelligence. So that'd be probably the closest to like a I sense life forms captain thing. Uh, passive radar or LIDAR, active radar or LIDAR, uh, EM, which is uh, electromagnetic, I think, uh, sensors, and then thermal and visual scanners. And let's see here. The neural activity scanner, there is an NES thing, but it's like backpack sized. It looks like on page 117. So what type of, do you think it'd be a bioscanner, like sniffing for... Those things, a densitometer is uses the object's natural gravity to measure its density. Um, uh, building up a 3D image of it from the inside and out. Hmm, that might be actually quite useful. A densitometer mm -hmm. does cost 20,000, though, credits. Which ones do we have? Uh... I don't think the ship ones are precise enough to make that scan. So you may be, unless you have yeah. one on hand, you may be doing the visual, you know, it's yeah, the it ocular pat down of the bags. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys, did anyone pick up any scanners? Nope. Okay. Got a computer, but nothing special on it. <laughs> did you guys get, uh, pick up a whiteboard <laughs> to hang from the, uh, in the cargo area of things you need to pick up? <laughs> yeah, make a list <laughs> that's it oh the other thing is uh i'm assuming there is a gym on board where do you think you guys would have that set up there's a lot of uh, very physical uh characters here uh so i assume there's you know um something like that it could be tucked in the corner of the cargo bay that's sort of where it was I i'm thinking picturing the serenity and that's where they had their gym uh set up but um uh, it's your so. ship so where, where would you think you'd set it up same on the Normandy as well. So probably mm. put it there. Seems right then. Okay. Is it close to the low berths? Is it close to the um, uh, the uh, crew areas? The ones that are closer to the low berths is probably going to one, uh, probably would be one that is more easily accessible by the uh, passengers if you intend to let them have access to that. Yeah, it's probably just. I would suggest it be um, next to the, uh, yeah, just to the right of the. Uh, <laughs> I can't yeah. ping it. Right here. I think Jim you know, the, will the, be down, anyway. the down shaft is on yeah. the other side of the wall from the down shaft. Okay. Maybe. So, yeah, it's like right around here. Yeah. On the right layer. I, yeah. I would suggest we let the passengers have access to sort of anything we can because it's a pretty small, boring week otherwise and we <laughs> Dave's like what are you talking about this is my life <laughs> yeah, we want them to speak highly of our of our vessel you know trying to build up a is reputation that, is that, is that, yeah we, we could do I mean I, I, in fact the passengers have got everything that they need on floor two without having to move around the ship um, if we want them to go down there that's fine but that's where all our cargo is I mean, they check out, so it's probably fine. You do have uh, cameras in the common area as well. So the cargo mm. bay, the lounge, uh, the uh, hallways, okay. you will have ways of, of kind of tracking right. uh, them. Maybe and only if anyone asks for it, you know, like, do you have any kind of a workout facility? Then we could share it with them. Yeah, okay. Because I think Alonzo's always trying to, you know, do a little upcharge. Oh, the gym. Yes, of course, of course. You know, like, <laughs> let's, you know, slip some credits here on the table and I'll print you a little gym pass. <laughs> uh, the only one who uh, I think would ask about that is actually Skier. Uh, Skier is the one who would like to have, uh, you know, uh, access to it. Um she uh, is happy to, uh, you know, make arrangements uh, with the crew if necessary for supervision or whatnot. But, you know, if it's a week away, she would like to have at least something to to, to keep herself occupied. No one has any issues with that. No, nope. that's no. fine. I might it might it might promote a conversation with her about you know. So 
you work out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. kind of, kind of, you know, um, <laughs> well, also how many deep. reps do you do? Yeah. What's your routine? You know, um, do you find it helps you? It helps me kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Why not? It could be your way of uh, uh, inadvertent, not, not inadvertently, but like uh, surreptitiously, um, you know, monitoring uh, them too. Like, oh, I'll be your spotter yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll take, I'll take sort of gym, I'll, I'll be the gym trainer for... <laughs> <laughs> okay I, just, uh, I think we'd also have the um the doors to the uh crew area and the engineering locked right yeah yeah, yeah. Inter- interestingly on the far trader uh, there appears to be no way to actually access the bridge oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think when we get to when we raise enough money we should buy a door for the bridge. Yeah. I'm assuming there is a door missing between the co- like next to the head there or the refresher. Um I, I, I feel like the amount of refreshers that are put on this thing is like a direct response to every D D dungeon that never accounts for lavatories. So <laughs> Um Okay, so what um what uh yeah so, so uh, we've got um a Ganny in the uh, pilot seat i'm assuming anchor is kind of in the co-pilot seat or perhaps reversed uh dr Ilias and dane where are you uh, positioning yourselves at uh, at takeoff uh, there are spare think... seats in the bridge i'll just be in one of the spare seats uh, getting ready for yeah there, there would be like one of those later. fold down yeah. kind of yeah. like i'm picturing like you know like like stu- uh, airline stewards uh what have <laughs> where they sort of fold down yeah. and sit into the thing but they disappear into the yeah it's just for the when the inevitable you... crash comes that you guys are secured you know this is a role-playing game oh. we're gonna we're gonna crash this thing at some point <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna stay alonzo are you staying on deck in deck two or are you heading down Uh, he'll if if Errol is in the cabin during takeoff, he'll stay with him to make sure he's okay. Okay. He doesn't want any uh, other passengers to come out later to a dead old man or vomit pile or anything gross, you know. <laughs> yeah, that is what the steward has to take care of. Don't we have someone for this? You're the someone for this. Um, okay, and then uh, Dr. Elias, where are you at uh, takeoff? Just on the bridge, okay. watching. Okay. Try not and, to get in the way. And I'm sorry, it was, it was Dane I was waiting to hear from. Dane, where are yeah. you for at uh, takeoff? Uh, I, I will be in the crew lounge. Crew lounge, okay. All right, uh, so then um, Dr. Uh, Doctor Captain, I want to keep on to sit, call everyone Dr. Captain Ganny. <laughs> um, tell us what it looks like as we see the um, rift wanderer uh i got that right uh, rift wanderer yep. rift wanderer take flight from the surface of spurl for the first time you get your clearance from the Jitico. Jitico, we'll see you again although it sounds a little bit like a threat <laughs> no well, i think you'll see that uh captain ganny does it all by the book all ship shape navy fashion okay there's none of this fancy ass pulling out at high speed he's gonna lift her up mm-hmm. and then gradually ease her out of the gates of the uh of the hangar i'm assuming yeah and then uh with proper communications uh to ground control will uh swoop us up into up through the atmosphere nice he's by the book is uh captain gurney and there's a probably a light rain that's coming down too like it's it's a coastal town so it's, it's sort of washed you know as you go out of the uh um the hangar and and uh, out into the open air uh it's also worth noting that you guys paid full price for this thing so it's not like like a lot of uh um you know uh sci-fi media has like kind of like the junker ship that you guys were able to put together that's not the case with with uh, this this is a ship with no quirks it is a relatively uh you know um relatively new fresh off the lot kind of thing so we, we oh, you take off, and uh, after a, a short, I was checking that to see what the time to orbit is with this. Uh, time to orbit is two thousand seconds. 
So I don't know how many minutes that'll be to get to orbit. Let's see here. 2,000 uh, divided by 60 half an hour, isn't it? is 33 half an hour. minutes, half an hour. So half an hour to orbit. And I think as you're, Alonzo, you know, as you're sitting in there and the, the whole thing's kind of rumbling as it's getting up, you can see Errol is a practiced, uh, you know, uh, orbital drinker, it seems, because he kind of uh, was able to get it going uh, and get it into his, uh, his belly. Um, but the, the flight to orbit is very uneventful. Uh, leading as you know, and there's that um, uh, almost like uh, instant uh, transition from the whole thing kind of shuddering to stillness as you're drifting through uh, space. The the thrusters are still going, uh, mind, uh, because you are you know you're gonna be moving your your way into the um, position to uh, uh, what do you call it to activate your jump drive, um, but this is another stupid question. But does Traveler do that thing where you burn for a certain length of time, you stop, and then you flip over and then slow down, or is it more advanced and you're able to just move? It used to be that you'd have to flip, I think. Okay. From from my memories of like 40 years ago, yeah. <laughs> I thought we did. Because Mayday, the original game, you did it with thrust vectoring, so. Okay, okay. So then uh, we'll assume it's, I'll, I'll look it up between now and uh, and then just to be sure, but uh, we'll assume that that's the case. You're still going to be burning for a while to uh, uh, to get yourself up to your speed. Um, what um, we need to do then is calculate the, I think, Dr. Ilias, if you're going to be the astrogator, it's time to get to work on that next. Yep. So this, assuming, let's see how many, give us a 1D... 1d6 times hours, is that right? For the scale down, the extra time. Yeah, 1d6 hours. So give us a d6 roll. Let's see how many hours it'll take you to roll, and then give us an easy astrogation using education. Six hours. You're taking your, you're absolutely double checking all your calculations. Absolutely. Yeah, still a, a novel enough activity. Um, that's a long time to be calculating stuff. Like that's got to be exhausting by the end of that. <laughs> Uh, but fortunately, amazing. Yep, no difficulty. You have a clear jump to get to Argona. Um, and in those uh, first couple of hours of getting yourself um, uh, into position, uh, you, Alonzo, you and uh, Errol drink yourself to the point where he needs to get himself put to bed. Uh, you will not see any of the other passengers uh, this day, um, but or at least until the jump is, is uh, made. Uh, what do you guys, what's the sort of, um, the way you spend your time uh, when you're moving yourself into position? Dr. Ilias is uh, getting himself or getting the calculations ready. What about the captain, uh, the security officer, and uh, Alonzo? Well, Alonzo's drinking with uh, Errol. So what, about, so what do I guess the captain and Dane, what do you guys do? I'm um, watching tri -D sports recordings in a lounge. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, so while Maybe Alonso keep an eye and... on the cameras as well, I'll keep a little bit eye on the cameras while I'm at it. Oh, in the um, in the lounge for the crew. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm just gonna just sort of I'll, I'll probably have access to the sort of shipwide cameras, and I'll just make sure everything's quiet and as we'd expect. Okay, uh, so yeah, the um, if you've you've got some kind of computer, I take it, right? Did you pick? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so you, um, you can easily. Mm -hmm. It's it's a simple matter of of uh, syncing that up so you can check the the, the cameras. Um, tell us a little bit about the crew lounge. What does that look like? Um, this is quite a new ship, so um, it it's not being personalized at all. There are no potted plants. Um, it's pretty it's pretty utilitarian. Um, there are you know there's a sort of central there's a central. I like to see it as almost like a. Um, um, a sort of circular sort of, sort of table with like actually sort of completely sort of round sort of seating around it, maybe mm. recessed slightly even into the floor. So it's actually sort of actually something you sort of jump into. Okay. Um, and um, it's got, um, you know, several sort of dispensers for um, sort of food um, and maybe a couple of, couple of screens on the walls, um, sort of standard screening just for um, maybe something that, that, that gives, uh, 
you, you can click it onto the forward view if you want to want to take a look at that. And also, there's something that you know you can actually switch onto the cameras so you can just see what's going on, or I, indeed any sort of commercial um, sort of news feed or sort of sports sports or. Okay. I don't feed. think we this. I don't think this a closet or whatever this room is defined. What do you guys think that's used for? Is that, uh, you know, uh, spacesuit storage or? Is it locker? Is it ship's locker or something? Or, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm, Maybe. I'm, I'm, I don't think it's on. It's uh, described on the uh, <coughs> mm. on a de deck plan. So, what do you guys think you make use of that for? Could be vac suits, but also uh, gun locker. Oh, hold on. It is defined on. What is it defined as? Look at that. In here. I mean, you guys could have had it uh, modified. Yeah, ship's locker. That's okay. what that is. Yeah. <laughs> there is a door to the uh, uh, to the bridge on the, on the actual <laughs> updated version. And it is an airlock uh, as well. So there's an airlock leading to the bridge. So if there is a failure in the... Um, uh, in the actual airlock here, uh, there is a like a, a stronger door to pre prevent the um, bridge from depressurizing. Mm -hmm. Whoever's watching, uh, you know, Trid Sports in the lounge, they're fucked, but uh, the bridge will be fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll message through at that point. Good luck to you all. And, uh... <laughs> okay. Um, and then, uh, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the passenger lounge looks like? And you can all jump in and, and add stuff to these different places if you like. Um, I think the passenger lounge, we have uh, several tables, maybe even maybe even five little tables with only two chairs, you know, like quite small. Like they show four there, but I think we're more often having planning for like, you know, five passengers who may not know each other. So we've got much smaller tables. Yeah. Uh, there's sort of the little bar set up in the, maybe in the corner, uh, the top corner there, uh, along the front there. Okay. Where there's sort of no windows mm -hmm. would be the bar along there so that Alonzo can come out of his room and sort of go to the bar area. Um, I guess we would have some kind of a, we might because i mean we obviously serve them food so maybe there's like the bar serves as like a buffet sort of thing or whatever to feed them their meals as well mm -hmm. um as far as the decor um it's it's probably a lot like uh graham said like it's a new ship it's nice it's shiny it's you know it's it doesn't have a lot of character yet other than the little tiny bit we've had a chance to inject but uh we haven't had a lot of time with it so i'm um, imagining that that's probably like on the on a checklist somewhere in alonzo's room is like you know at each place we travel to maybe is to like find some interesting decor for the the place mm -hmm. and leave a copy of your book behind of course well if there's a you know a <laughs> gift shop i've got you know books for, <laughs> books for them to buy <laughs> um what uh so after maybe the you... one feature that alonso did put together is just like he said how he introduced the crew maybe there's like an actual plaque uh on the wall that he's had made that's got like our five pictures our role on the ship and like just a short little blurb about each each of us for the passengers to sort of remember the crew or read about them so an important question then uh the picture on the wall of our crew standing next to uh the rift wanderer uh who is smiling in that photograph and who is not yeah i don't know if anyone smiles on our crew <laughs> oh <laughs> dr Dan Dan is probably is smiling it. Yeah, he loves his ship. I think Anchor would be as well too. That strikes me in the way Carl's been <laughs> describing him. Okay. okay, there you go. There you go. So yeah. you got a picture. Yeah, there's a side profile of some planet. Yeah, there's like a big. Yeah, like you said, at the top maybe is the picture of the ship with the five of us standing there, and then there's like below it, you know, in order the captain, the doctor, okay. myself, and then our two sort of security guys, pilot, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we've got under there. Okay. 
then with um uh once you put uh, errol to bed uh, is there anything else you wish to do before i mean you, you uh actually let's do this why don't you give us let's see how you're holding your liquor because there is rules for environmental hazards and i imagine booze could be considered one of those I was looking at that when I was reading the healing rules. I was going to say that he's he's probably not drinking as hard as Errol because he does know that he has duties on the ship. So yeah. it's probably like a two to one or three to one kind of ratio. One, I don't know how your stomach feels when you jump into um, uh, like the, you, you do the hyperspace jump or whatever. Uh, it is, uh, that might be upsetting on the tummy. Yeah. So. I mean, I do think Alonzo's lived a bit of a tough life, so... Yeah, you know, he, it's not that he's a afraid to drink. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, it is. Here we go. Would you give us an endurance check, please? We'll make it. Um, this will be a uh, routine, so an eight, or uh, routine is a six. Good news, guys. I have rules for space anthrax in here. So you just made it. Yeah. So you're like, God, that old miner. He certainly uh, he he's petered out uh, by the end of it, but he certainly pushed you to whew, uh, an early limit for today. What else? Do, if anything, do you do uh, as you're drifting towards the, uh, the jump point? Um, I probably do, um, after, you know, getting Errol to bed, I, I probably do knock on each door and just check with the passengers, see if there's anything that they need or, um, any special requests for food meals for the next week, that kind of thing, like allergies, um, just, just that kind of polite ch second check-in that, that's a little more private. Like they may not have wanted to say something in front of everyone, but just sort of that thing. Like, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe he's got some pretense of he brings some little night snack or something. I don't know, some something to people or an extra pillow or a towel or whatever it is. He's got this little pretense for knocking turn on the down, door. Turn down service. Yeah, so, basically. Yeah. yeah. What you find um, is that, um, hold on, one sec. I'm going to grab my, our co-referee here. Hi. So we will also have a crew meeting once everything is on autopilot. Mm. Just see how we feel. Yeah, I think we should have a, always okay. have our sort of post-departure crew meeting. Yeah, so then um, you all get back maybe together. One, one of the things you do find, what I was going to say, uh, is that... Um, uh, so the... Uh, I think that Errol ended up in this room here, uh, sorry, this room uh, here, the closest to the exit. And originally, uh, Tallwee, Mr. Tallwee had been here and Skier, uh, Ms. Skier had been here. Um, when you check <coughs> on uh, Mr. Tallwee, uh, you find, or what you expect to be Ms. Skier, you find Mr. Tallwee answers the door. And he says, uh, oh, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Alonzo. Uh, did you need something? And he looks like he's been, um, he, he's wearing a comfortable clothes and whatnot. He seems like he's me relaxing and he seems to have been reading something. Uh, oh, it's not a breath. Yeah. Bit of a hmm. not, nudge, nudge, <laughs> wink, wink, eh? Yeah, yeah. Say no uh, more, say no more. <laughs> yeah, no, of course not. Uh, just, you know, checking in, make sure everything's okay. See if there's any special requests for the journey. You know, food allergies, um, no, from Anything the door, you can do see he's you. alone in there. Uh, it mm. seems like he may have swapped rooms with her. I, uh, maybe I'll, yeah. Uh, so you decided to swap rooms. Oh. We had you uh, across the hall there. No. Uh, uh, Miss Skier asked if I would mind, and 
Um, having <clears throat> having seen uh, what's his name, uh, Mailer. Uh, I yes. expected that it Milton? might be quieter to be closer to the lounge than uh, to him, so I was happy to change. Mm, of course, yes. Sure, no problem. I'll, I'll change the manifest. Thank you. That's appreciated. And I, I require nothing further. Um, I, let us know when the jump will be commenced. Uh, or let me know when the jump will be commenced. And uh, yes. There, there'll be a shipwide announcement. Okay. Um, and when you check in on the next room down in that, uh, you find Miss Skier uh, in there. And uh, she answers the door. Likewise, you know, it seems like she's like relaxing. Uh, in she's got to, um, you know, like uh, yoga pants or, or sweatpants uh, on and a, a tank top. Uh, and uh, she, you can see she's pretty muscular uh, as well. Not like bodybuilder muscular, but she's a very fit woman. Mm -hmm. She answers the door and says, ah, Mr. Santaro, can I help you with something? Ah, uh, yes, just uh, doing final passenger check-in before the jump. See if there's anything you need. Nothing further. Uh, the, uh, oh, I, you'll tell, I, I swapped rooms with Mr. Talwee. Yes, it's been noted. I, I'll change the manifest. Thank you. Um, then, uh, if there's nothing else, I, I require nothing further. Let us, uh, I'll keep an ear up for the uh, warning for jump. Yes, it will be a shipwide announcement. Thank you. Uh, and she closes to, uh, the um, the uh, uh, door to her um, her quarters. The rest of them go uneventful. Um, yeah. Mr. Hobbs has a couple of questions for you, I imagine. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, and then uh, Miss Paller seems to be uh, busy reading something. Like she's already made herself at home. You know, shit's all sprawled out across the. Uh, uh, the desk. Uh, turns out there's a lot more stuff in her little carry-on uh, bag than what you would expect. And um, otherwise, you're able to rejoin everyone. So if you're doing that in the in the little lounge, maybe you walk into the lounge where Dane is, and Dane, you can smell Alonzo once he gets kind of even close to you. Like, <laughs> oh, he smells like what my, Mr. Melter did when he got on board. Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna come in. I'll, 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 I'll note it. But I'm not coming to. Okay. Uh, and then well, once. Uh, okay, Alonso. Everything all right? Yeah. Uh, one strange event. Um, Miss Skier and Mr. Towley switched rooms. Uh, I'll have to note that on the manifest, and they're all the same. I think uh, Captain uh, and uh, Doctor, you both would be able to walk in at this point as well, too. Maybe you've completed calculations. You've got it on autopilot, moving towards mm. the uh, point. So you walk in it and it smells like holy shit, like someone is celebrating in here because it smells like liquor. All go well with the passengers? Ah, very well, yes. Interesting lot, of course. I'll have my full report for you in the morning. Not too early, I gather. <laughs> no. No rush, right? It's casual. <laughs> there may yeah. be there may be a small amount of tension between the passengers. Um if a bit of a union man seems to be reactivated, but uh and a couple of corporate types that he's worked against, but they didn't seem to know each other, but definitely worth keeping an eye on. They yeah. swapped rooms around him already. So clearly he's causing some ripple. I mean, this ship is, it's hardly a drop shuttle, but um, it's a little tight. They've got a week to get to know each other. Um, we'll have to sort of guide that along because a week in, in, in jump space on one of these things, it drags. Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, Doctor, you had not had an opportunity to share your uh, insight about the um, uh, the amount of vaccinations yeah. that Ms. Skier had. Yeah, but I think yeah, when, when Dane says, you know, about it dragging, uh, Elias will say something like, well, I think Ms. Ms. Skier will make use of the gym facilities. No doubt she seems to uh, be from... 
you're from a line of work, Dane, and I'll, I'll show him the sort of just the page of confidential, uh, confidentiality. We'll of course apply, but just to show them her vaccination record is almost as impressive as yours and Ghani's and uh, anchors. Mm. Okay. So <laughs> Dane and um... a very specific period as well. So like a one one rotation on on duty, Megatha, four years. Yeah. Do you guys have any? Let me take a look at your character sheet. See what it'll be easier than me just fishing for skills here. Let me see if there is anything. I can't remember how ubiquitous the uh, profession skill is in this game, uh, like it is in some other games where it's used to. Oh come on, uh, level twenty. Not very. I don't think. No, no, definitely not from what you've seen. Um. So for you. Um. <laughs> I think, Dane, you can give us a leadership check, uh, but use intelligence instead of social. Uh, and Captain Ganny, let's see here. I think... I think leadership as well uh, with intelligence as a modifier. Okay, cool. Which you guys each use those separately. With intelligence is helpful. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So you look at it, and I mean, like, both of you draw the same conclusion that uh, Dr. Ilya says, like, there's very few professions where you have that much, you know, uh, vaccination that early on. Um, there are maybe, you know, um, traders, but even then, that's more of a, you pick it up as you go. It's not regimented the way that uh, the timing is on this one. This is, if you look, if you were told nothing else and you both looked at this, you would immediately think, yeah, it's, it's ex-military. But there's a lot, there's a lot of ex-military. And, you know, we all live lives. We all move on. Yes. She's, she's lived one life. She's probably living another. Um, I can relate to that. And it would not be the first co corporation to have uh, corporate security. In fact, you know that the um, Argona apparently has a military contract or a mercenary contract uh, to uh, to keep itself safe. Right. Uh, of interest, um, the, you do um, the ability to um, what, what's the um, the phrasing of it? Is it uh, not not force multiplier, but uh, to exert force or whatever? The, the range uh, of uh, with which it can exert force is very limited on Argona. Um, one of the things what that uh, one of the reasons that people are uh, involved in the Borderland Alliance there is because the uh, while the Third Imperium does pass through every now and then, they do not have anything near a regular presence there, and the extent of the guaranteed safety is pretty much right around the station at Argona. Uh, there are still other settlements in the system, um, but from where you jump in generally and from the other systems, piracy and whatever other problems that plague this kind of, you know, rift's edge uh, sector, um, it, it's definitely a problem in Argona. Yeah. Okay. So, mm. anything else you guys need to discuss before you conduct the job? Dr. Ilias would, would turn to Alonzo not commenting on on the on the booze wafting uh, off him but would ask out of curiosity any idea why a journalist is traveling to argona is she is there a story to be found there I mean, there's usually a story to be found anywhere I, i'm not sure I, I could ask if you'd like me to find out more I'm merely curious what 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 brings uh, from the description of the world i would not have expected um someone of uh, like like uh, cassidy Paller to, to head there Hmm. And I'll schedule you in for a uh, maybe liver check uh, during the <laughs> <time. laughs> Purely precaution. Of course, of course. Always appreciated. Uh, anything else you guys wish to do before uh, we transition to your ship? Any other matters the crew needs to discuss? I think I would let the captain know that one of the passengers in low berth uh, had a heart surgeon. I'm sure him that all necessary precautions have been taken. It does not preclude jumping, just an adjustment of the, but just so the captain is aware. Okay. Okay. 
Um, then, uh, if there is nothing else, then we'll make the jump. So it's a, uh, it's about, like I said, about uh, 12 hours to get out to uh, the space where you're finally free and you see all, all those uh, lights on the, um, on the sensors, uh, the gravity, uh, gravity sensors. Gravity, why did I say it that way? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, Firing up the jump drive requires an easy engineering jump drive check. Uh, so it'll take 1d6 uh, times 10 minutes and is modified by education. So I believe, Captain Ganny, this is your wheelhouse now. Yep, and I also will get a bonus from the good doctor's um, amazing role. Oh, nice. Task, task, chain. task chain, yeah. Mm. Oh, right, because it's a task chain, right. I love this game. It takes 40 minutes. <laughs> okay, so 40 minutes to get yourself, uh, to get the calculations done. And then would you go ahead and give us an e easy, so four or higher. So it's the jump drive and is maintained. You're there not there using well. unrefined fuel. And you're not within the 100. Oh, so you can try it within the 100 diameter limit. Just, um, it ain't good. Look at that. Oh, nice. Whew. All right, so the next thing we need to do is make a bunch of willpower checks because you guys are traveling into the... Oh, hold on. <laughs> I may be thinking of a grimmer and darker future here. Hold on. <laughs> All right, uh, so then... Did I mention my third eye? <laughs> exactly. Uh, would you guys... Uh, so I guess, hold on, let's, let's let uh, um, the uh, traveler heads uh, tell us what this... Uh, looks like and feels like so james why don't you tell us what does it look like and feel like for the crew as they transition into uh um what is it called in this game Ooh, making the jump. Yeah, good... i think it's going to be uh uh somebody correct me but i have a feeling that you'd get a a suddenly uh feeling of oh be a perhaps a, a shudder and then suddenly smooth running at that point mm -hmm. and there's just going to be complete um smoothness once yeah. we're actually into jump space uh, the description given on 157 i'm just looking for that yeah, yeah 157, 157 is while in jump space the ship is completely and utterly cut off from the universe it hangs in a shimmering bubble of boiling hydrogen a pocket dimension from which nothing can escape it cannot communicate with the normal universe not even by a psionic means it is utterly alone and it will take uh so Roughly one week. Would uh, Captain Ganny, since you were the one, or maybe uh, while well, the uh, astrogator uh, make this, um, give us a 6d6 roll. 6d6 plus 148. That's how many hours the trip will take. So that is, let's see here, 148 plus 23 divided by 24. It's a week and 1.25 days. <laughs> Okay. And you really don't want to miss jump, do you? You. No, no, no. <laughs> you actually arrive in the 40k universe if that happens, so. <laughs> 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 All right. So then you, um, yeah, so uh, with a, a brief shutter and then toof, you guys are off and traveling. Really, um, unless there's any kind of catastrophic mechanical failure, there's nothing to do but wait at this point. So. Uh, let's talk about what you guys typically do. Uh, there's going to be stuff that's going to be happening over the course of this trip because it's a role-playing game. Um, but um, what do you intend on... Uh, what do you guys typically do as part of your... Um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, part of your, your standard routine while you're in war. Or in jump, I guess. Well, Those Captain were... Ganny is working on his M drive studies. Mm, okay. So you're trying to bone up on something. Uh, how about uh, Dane, Alonso, or Dr. Elias? Uh, Alonso will be spending his time, you know, trying to keep the passengers happy, but at the same time, uh, he does pry into their lives a little bit. Like, you know, he can't help but do his investigations that he's used to, you know, 
performing. It's sort of become part of how he talks to people now. So, mm-hmm. um, he, he always is a bit of an investigative reporter and also, you know, hoping, uh, poking them about what they know about the planet that they're heading to, you know, maybe if they know of some adventure that he could find while he's there kind of thing, that kind of, that kind of, those kind of questions. Mm-hmm. That's what he'd be up to. The Ilias will of course follow Dane's strict exercise regime. And make use of, of of the gym, and then uh, probably in the afternoons to sort of follow up on her own studies and and read the ver- various case studies and, and and notes, and maybe delve a bit, little bit deeper in Mister Hobbs's um, medical file or what what access he has. And it's going to be and, extremely fascinating. Like that, that there is definitely uh, something to be gained so, from the uh, Sindalin uh, genetic engineering techniques. And then for relaxation. Uh, He'll, I think he can sometimes be found reading Alonzo's book in, 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 in the common area. You know, so slowly, chapter by chapter, not yeah. like engrossed <laughs> in it necessarily, but, you know, curious and, and sort of making an effort. Ah, uh, I'll let Jeff decide, you know, how good it is or, or if, if it would be to everyone's liking. But yeah, I think I think Dr. Elias will read it just, just you know, out of curiosity. Was the first book fiction, nonfiction? Uh, the, the, so the the... I believe the first book was about his um, his last adventure there, the one that he uh, where he went undercover and he broke up that uh, was it a politician? Yeah, it was corrupt a politician mm-hmm. who you know was doing some sort of corporate stuff. There's like all kinds of espionage, and uh, so I mean, you can tell me if that's the kind of book that the doctor would like. So it's a it's a true story to a point. Um, Alonzo has definitely it's a little bit autobiographical and he's like sort of turned himself into this uh not I wouldn't say like James Bond but you know probably a little bit more like the Fletch books I don't know mm. if any of you guys So he's ever done read... what all journalists are told not to do which is to inject himself into the story. Absolutely and he is like <laughs> but he's like he's like this uh he's sort of like a charismatic investigator yeah. uh and I'd say there's like a bit of hu- he, it's it's a humor a little bit of a humorous book uh, bent on it though like he knows that it's not like it's a little tongue in cheek right it's a little uh, mm. okay full of jokes more than uh, tr- just pure intrigue or whatever okay and how about Dane what does he do with his uh, his time typically well in the simulated day that we have on ship because of course there is no day and night. Uh, Dane will typically wake up. <laughs> Dane's early. slowly becoming Michael Bynes character from The Abyss. <laughs> <laughs> Cut his hand and <sighs> yeah. <laughs> he'll wake up in a sweat, cold sweat. He'll 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 he'll, he'll wake up thinking, oh, I've, I've got a jump to do. I've got to, I've got to do a drop. I've got to do a drop. No 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 no. I don't have to do a drop. He'll have a he'll sort of disappoint himself by by having the broken sleep. He'll have the heavy breakfast. He will he will he will hit the gym. Yeah. Um, he will kind of make himself as busy as he can. He, he will he will probably try and come down from that as well. Just just just. You know, um, just some easy, easy listening or something, and then, and then, yeah, he'll probably he'll probably undertake some sort of personal studies as well. Okay, so the reason is is uh, the easy listening. I'm picturing him blasting Chuck Mangione from his. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, who is next to your uh, cabin? Uh, lots of turn it down. <laughs> Stop. Well, actually. Uh, Across the hall is Errol Melter. Oh yeah, <laughs> well, that's right. You're the way at the far end. Yeah, yeah. You're next to come uh, there. Yeah, El yeah. Hobbs. <laughs> Poor bastards in his room. Just look. Is this how things <laughs> normally go? Um, so it is. I think on that first day. So let's. Um, uh, first off, thank you for that, guys. That's that's uh, good. Uh, good uh, stuff to work with for how you guys spend your time, um, and why, where you're likely to run into people uh, for things. Uh, so I think, uh, Dane, assuming that you are, um, yeah, you're me uh, moving down to where the gym is. What you find uh, very early on is you find uh, Miss Skier is already there, 
and yeah. you um you know so you come around and she's just finishing up you know uh uh lifting some things doing a, you know things and she sits up and sees you and she says it's the jump right yeah no i yeah. uh, i'm sorry i i didn't uh i assumed that you uh had things to keep yourself occupied uh, and she throws a towel over her shoulder that she's taken that Alonzo has uh, handed to him and it's monogrammed with the name of the uh, uh, Rift Wanderer on it um, she says I'll set you for a spot if you like yeah great okay great. Uh, so over the course of um, it, there's not a lot of talk it's it's you guys I, I imagine work out in kind of a unless you try to prompt up uh, you know prompt any kind of no, chat keep it easy keep it yeah yeah. What you can see over the course of it, at one point where you're sort of, you know, uh, either assisting one another or, you know, uh, um, where she's working out and you're working out, you notice that uh, on her um, left bicep, there is, it's very, very faint, but you can see that there is something that has been removed. Uh, there is like a unit uh, insignia, probably, because that's where they sort of go. And um, it has been removed in a, it looks like, it, like it's not like taking a lighter to it or anything like that, um, but it is a very, um, it's probably not uh, done by, you know, a, a plastic surgeon or anything like that. It's some kind of automated thing that just covers over them. And because her skin is, is you know, darker, uh, it may be that it's just, there's a more obvious scar tissue. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think if, if you give us a, again, your, one of your best skills here, recon, <laughs> it's yeah. that's, untrained. That's what I'm going to be working on now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you know, if you, uh, do you have streetwise at all? No. No? Okay. Let's think of what else, what else this might I'll be. Just, I'll just there. blow shit up, you know? <laughs> you know what? Why don't you do it? This is, I, I, I think that this is, do you have admin at all or bureaucracy? Um, there is no such skill as bureaucracy. It'll be difficult to have that. Okay, okay. No, no, not really. Um, um, do you have... Uh, why don't you just give us... Let's do this. Why don't you just give us a... A flat education check. No modifier. Yeah, sure. That's going to be a straight roll then, I think. Okay. Okay, go. Okay. Okay, got an eight. So this is actually... Um, what you can tell from it, uh, because you can pretty much, because this thing was automated and done, you can kind of make out the rough shape of this stuff. And um, because of your service beforehand and in this region, you are able to make out that this is, there is a unit um, or a, a company called a TMR, which is Trojan Military Recruitment. Uh, they can kind of be thought of as the Trojan Reaches uh, kind of prefab mercenary unit. Uh, they recruit people in, their business model is they get people in, they make them into combat ready troops, and then they lease them out to other places, uh, often to other uh, mercenary units to, because they, they recognize that they're getting them at a, you know, um, they're getting them where they're green without a lot of experience. So the pricing is uh, commensurate with that. But what it also means is that they effectively, um, the, the people who are trained by them, they don't start earning larger amounts until later on. There is not the kind of esprit de corps that comes with uh, the um, TMR. They try to do a version of what any other military unit would do, but it is very standardized, which means that the logos are pretty plain Jane. It's like, you know, TMR1, TMR2, like that kind of stuff. That, you can't tell what specific unit it was because you're just, you're not, you know, clever enough uh, to, to pour it out, but you've seen these kind of plain Jane uh, unit logos before. It's fabricated esprit de corps by a corporation. Yeah. So, and it's not unusual, I think, in your experience from your role for people to, you know, uh, to put that, uh, put that behind them to, to, if they either join another military unit to get rid of that thing, because you get your little, mm -hmm. like, you know, everyone gets the uh, tattoo because that's what proper military units get. Um, yeah. And as soon as you realize it's like corporate, you know, team building afterwards, you're like, oh, maybe I, I think I don't need this anymore. No. Um, no. 
so that but that, that seems to be it, it does kind of answer a question that if you had any about uh, what dr Elias noted yeah assuming it's not uh, you know uh, it's just something you happen to notice um she makes no comment on your um whatever you know tattoos or whatnot that you may have to suggest your um uh, your military uh, history or service record i guess yeah Otherwise, yeah, it just she works out and then uh, thanks you uh, for uh, for spotting her and then heads back. So I will follow that up, but not now. So a week is a long time. Yep. So I think it's about gaining 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 trust and um, just the simplicity of working out, which probably is doing us both good. I'll just I'm just going to leave that and maybe I'll explore it a little bit mid journey. Maybe we'll okay. see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Dr. Ilias and uh, Captain Ganny, do you guys spend any time in the passenger uh, lounge area or do you spend, you kind of restrict yourself to the crew uh, deck? I think I might go and show my face once. And, uh, but because uh, I feel I ought to, but it's not my natural thing. Okay. I'll scuttle back to my books. Oh, you're muted, uh, David. So I am. <laughs> Dr. Elias would happily go and mingle um, just to get a bit more experience about traveling in the wider in the wider universe. And you know, he, he's used to social engagements in the faculty or, or you know, an annual revenue celebration parties at the lab he worked at and that sort of thing. So he'll happily go and mingle. Okay. And that should be more about with Hobbes about, you know, the, the Dranaxian customs of, of you know, preserving the, the the gene line and all of that so he'll, he'll happily mingle uh, and he will that will be something that will um that mr hobbs will happily latch on to it is a, a topic that he does know a great deal about and he's got a great deal of experience about and he's very comfortable talking about it so he is more than happy to fill your you know um and he is that kind of um, we are talking about the, you know, the equivalent of the 53rd century uh, here, but he might as well be a medieval noble with the way he talks about his lineage and whatnot, because um, he can go back very, very far. It was whatever it was, 1600 years uh, divided by 25. That's how many generations back we're going. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a lot of people he can talk about, and he even will bring up like sort of displays. It's something he's quite proud of too. It seems not not in a you know uh, an arrogant way. He is kind of atypical in that uh, in that manner. Um, he's just proud of it because he doesn't know anything not to be. You know um, it, that would be the environment. He strikes you as a very sheltered individual, even at twenty seven. Um. And that sort of social thing is exactly why Ghani is sitting on the bridge reading yeah. his books. So, uh, am I uh, the kind of showing himself to all the crew, to all the passengers? Is that something that Captain Ghani enjoys doing, or is it something he feels obliged to do? He's obliged. Okay, so that answers the mood he would be in. Does Captain Ghani have mm -hmm. any points in recon? No, no. Okay, would you give us then a? Uh, it's an intelligence, uh, uh, basically an unskilled intelligence check, please. Ah, doo -doo -doo -doo. Well, I'll just pick. Um... It would be minus three to the mod as a modifier for intelligence. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay. Um... Actually, how can I roll the. Uh... Oh, yeah, sorry. Intellect minus three. Okay. Actually, I'll let you roll with a boom. Okay. Um, you are making your way through the. Uh, cargo uh, hold and I, I imagine this is you know um, the cargo hold is pretty stacked I, I'm actually like a like a, a freighter ship where it's got like stuff stored up but there's places to walk between and whatnot for you to load and unload things um, you're making your way through there and you think you hear something crank kind of fall and you're like I'm sure it's nothing uh, the ship shouldn't make sounds like that um, unless there's someone down there or something causing it. Uh, so would Captain Genny investigate that any further or? Yes, because he would know the sounds of his ship like the back of his hand. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, would... you don't know where the hell it was. So you would have to take more time to sort of search around if you wish to. Yep. I would probably go and check the 
are the two doors. Make sure there's nothing wrong with the uh, hold doors. Yeah. So, so I'd be looking around those two areas first. Sure. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't you give us a uh, another intelligence check, but this time at minus one. We'll see you're taking more time. And I'll give you a boon because it's your ship, as you say. Okay. Oh, still. Still not quite. Yeah. And oh, sorry, my. There you go. My mouse is going bonkers. My boon was useless. Yeah, your boon is not great there. All right. So you do a search around and you don't know what the hell. You check the two doors. The doors seem to be completely secured. Like there's nothing, no tampering, no whatever. Um, and you're looking around and you're not even quite sure what it is that fell. Like whatever fell, you, you're not able to find it in the hour or so that you spend looking around. Hmm. Well, I guess I'm, I'm sure there's nothing gone wrong on the uh, on the doors, etc. So, no. uh, so you... with that, I'll go have a look in the engine room just okay. to check. You make your way. You can picture you're walking along from this, and then you hear kind of a um, a squooshing sound. You're like, "What the Ooh. fuck?" And you look down. Oh, and you smell it before you see it. You've stepped in some kind of scat. It doesn't look big. Um, like, effectively, if you picture the uh, leavings of a, you know, like a cocker spaniel or something that size, um, that's what you've just stepped in. That's not good. On my nice clean ship. No. And your boots, too. Um... And I think with Captain Ganny trying to discovering that uh, they seem to have some stowaway, at least one, I guess, stowaways possibly on board. That's what we'll bring our session to a close because we're out of time. Uh, so for <laughs> those listening at home, thank you so much for joining us for session two of our Borderland Run Traveler campaign. Um, as is always the case, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns regarding the session, uh, the campaign, or the game we're playing, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section down below, and I'll endeavor to reply in a timely fashion. I have a, a appointment uh, this afternoon with getting caught up in uh, uh, my uh, comments. I was going to do that yesterday, but then I uh, heard the call of Skyrim, and uh, I, I needed to spend some time doing some Viking shit. Uh, I will resist that call today and get caught up in that. Um, in addition, there is a link down below to the Dungeon Musings Discord server in the description of this video. Uh, you can find a channel there dedicated to... I don't know if we have a Traveler channel there yet, uh, but we have a, a, a sort of games channel and channels dedicated to every other game we run on the channel. Uh, there is a really terrific community that has built up over the past couple of years over there, and you are more than welcome to join us over there. Um, there is also a link down below to our friends at Noble Knight Games. Noble Knight Games is the preeminent retailer of heart, sorry, preeminent unionized, they'd be very welcome in Argona, uh, retailer of uh, hard to find and out of print RPGs in North America. Now, uh, not only do they have a uh, terrific selection of uh, new uh, board games, card games, and role playing games, they have an unmatched uh, selection of hard to find and out of print RPGs. Uh, including, which will be arriving tomorrow, my uh, long-awaited copy of the pocket edition of uh, Mongoose's uh, Conan. Uh, I finally get my con pocket Conan adventure. Um, there is, uh, not only do they have, um, and I will say as well that, uh, I did pick up two things that were on my want list that did come in. They have a want list feature. If you put it on the want list, if they don't have it in stock, they'll email you. You can pick it up. Sometimes that stuff is priced quite, if it's high in demand, it's going to be priced accordingly. But the two things that I had come in this weekend, um, were both priced below, um, the, uh, what do you call it? Below, uh, the, uh, publishers, uh, like whatever it is, the listed price. Um, and uh, one of them actually had gone down. Previously, when it was more high in demand, uh, they ha commanded a higher price for it. I got less than uh, cover price for one of my Ars Magica 5th edition books. Um, so uh, in addition to that, uh, if you um, make a purchase of $10 or more through their website, be sure to enter the code THEMUSE at checkout, and you will save yourself 10% on your purchase, like I did when I made my impulse purchase last week. Um, in addition, uh, there is a link down below. Uh, oh, if, and if you're listening to this at a later date, uh, the code changes about every four or five months. So if you find that discount code doesn't work, uh, be sure to come back and check a more recent video and you should find one that does work. 
Uh, in addition, uh, there is a link down below to something called Heroes Save Villages. That is the charity fundraising campaign we run on the channel. It benefits the SOS Children's Villages International Charity, a really amazing organization active in over 130 countries, benefiting over 80,000 orphaned and abandoned children, including, at the time of recording, ongoing relief efforts in, the, uh, in uh, Ukraine and the surrounding countries, and they have been doing so for uh, more than a year now. Um, any donations that go through that link go directly to SOS Children's Villages International. None of it goes to the channel or any other middleman. Just goes to help out the kids who benefit from their services. And uh, as a, uh, we have two small ways of saying thank you. One of them is uh, to um, provide a. Um, what do you call it? Uh, one of them is uh, to, uh, if you donated $10 or more uh, through the we the website uh, Canadian, uh, you'll be able to vote on the first half year's worth of uh, charity sessions that we're running. This year, our charity sessions will be running about every two months, and uh, all six sessions will link together into one long story called the Year of Ill Omens. And uh, each uh, time after each of those sessions, the donors will have an opportunity to vote on what time period we're playing in, what kind of specific era, you know, specific year, what game we're using, and a bunch of other stuff, so what kind of characters we're playing, and we'll, next weekend we will be playing the first of those sessions, which has been shaped by the donors. We'll be playing a, a session of uh, Amazing Adventures, a terrific modern era, day era version of the uh, call, uh, Castles and Crusades uh, system, the Siege Engine, uh, set in the time of uh, the Golden Age of Piracy. So it should be a lot of fun. We have some really interesting characters and some great players showing up for that. So it'll be really, really good. And then after that, donors who have donated $10 or more through the Heroes Save Villages campaign will then be able to vote on the next one. In addition to that, if you donate $25 or more, then every $25 gives you one chance to win the grand prize or one of the other great prizes in our next charity raffle. One of the prizes available will be an opportunity to play a game with us. I'll write something uh, for you. I'll give you some options of what kind of game you want to play. We will be recording the session, and we have uh, roster players who have agreed to play in that session. So that's one of our prizes. I also have two copies of the now out of print Degenesis uh, Rebirth Edition. Uh, I think it's the Rebirth Edition. Is that the white one? That's the white one, right? Yeah, yep. two copies of those, brand new that I picked up when uh, they were uh, doing their fire sale to get rid of all of them. I've got those, and we will have other great prizes for that in addition to the game. So lots of great prizes uh, that you could win in the charity raffle that will be happening at the end of June. Um, we'll announce more prizes as we uh, become aware of what they are. And um, every uh, $25 Canadian that you donate gives you one chance to win at that next uh, raffle. And because you donated more than $10, you also would have an opportunity to vote on the Charity Initiatives Challenge channel of the Dungeon Musings Discord server for our next two sessions. So uh, if you have donated since January 1st, uh, 2023, and you have not cast your vote, right now it's too late. But for the next two, you still have an opportunity to vote for the next two sessions, and there will be ways to help shape how those are connected. So not only do you get a chance to win some cool gaming stuff and to help shape the game we're playing, this year-long uh, charity campaign, you also get a chance to help out some kids who could really use some help. So you are a winner all the way around. Uh, the last thing, speaking of winners, I will say is a huge thank you to our stalwart travelers. So, Jeffrey, David, Graham, and James, thank you so much for playing today, guys. This was a shit ton of fun. I can't believe how fast the time flew by. This game really, uh, yeah, it really is is um, easy to get uh, caught up in the mechanics and the settings. So, thanks so much for playing today, guys. No, thank you. It's been fun. We will be back aboard our uh, vessel in uh, two weeks' time. But until then, we hope that we gave you a couple of hours to take your mind, or a few hours, to take your mind off of the troubles of our world and see about the situation on the Rift uh, Wanderer and uh, what potential issues may be coming. I'm sure all these sneaking, um, you know, secret things about these different characters, nothing will come of it. I'm sure it'll be a... And the spore, probably... I mean, who doesn't bring animal spore on board and just leave it anyway? I'm sure that's nothing for the captain to worry about. But we'll find out what whether it is in two weeks' time. And until then, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and happy gaming.